Well, thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be here. I do want to start just by apologizing for um, my health this evening. Started coming down with a sore throat last night, and it's kind of all up in my head today. Uh, so I'm a little bit lightheaded, which is maybe a good thing or maybe a bad thing. We'll find out as I ramble on. Um, but I am feeling a little sick, so I might need to be blowing my nose a little bit. So I just apologize for any sounds that I might be making that aren't delicious sounds. <laughs> um, and also just wanted to thank Brad for setting this up. It's a great pleasure to be here speaking with all of you. And it really reflects one of the wonderful things about the psychedelic community in the world where, um, you know, Brad found me through Facebook and found the event that I put on at Ashland and brought him up and he spoke at Exploring Psychedelics Conference this past year, uh, this past April. And then uh, he said, well, you know, if you're ever down in LA, I was like, well, I'm, gosh, I'm never down in LA. And then like a week after he had asked me about coming down and maybe giving a talk here at some point, um, got an invitation to a cousin's wedding that happened in Laguna Beach. So that was just two days ago. And so then I contacted Brad and said, well, hey, I am going to be down. And I know it's not the time that you guys, at the beginning of the month is when you usually hold things. I said, okay, well, you usually hold things at the beginning of the month, but would you want to do something at the end of the month? And he said, okay. And that's one of the beautiful things about the psychedelic community, that those of us who are active in this area, um, I think, spend a lot of time reaching out to each other and making connections. And Ashley Booth with the AWARE Project, she's another one that we've been able to connect to. And it's just beautiful that here we are, hundreds of miles apart. And, you know, I can contact Brad and say, hey, I'm going to be in town for a weekend. Could you put something together? And, and here we all are. And it's a great pleasure for me to be speaking with you. The last time I think I spoke in L.A., the only other time I've ever spoken in LA, I think it was in 2010 at a MAPS event. So that was six years ago now and certainly wouldn't have had any plans to come back to LA. The only good thing about LA is I get to listen to KCRW in my car, which is really nice. Um, I went to college at Occidental College, you know, just, just over the way here. And I loved that. I loved listening to Morning Becomes Eclectic on KCRW. And we had this little hill in the back of, um, Occidental College that's called Mount Fiji. It's not really a mountain. Um, you know, it's just this little hill. I used to go up there at night. It's kind of a loner. Still, I'm kind of a loner. I would just go up there at night. I'd get high, and I'd walk up to the top of this mountain at night, and I'd sit there, and I'd look at all the lights, and I'd kind of imagine, I wonder what this would be like without any people, without just anything here, and kind of indulge my maybe post-apocalyptic fantasies, like, oh, well, one day it's all going to be gone and it's going to be back to wherever it was. Um, but I kind of grew tired of too many people in L.A. Um, but, I mean, I'm not trying to put any of you down because you all live here, and it's fine. It's a good place. But I was happy when I got out. But it was really nice to listen to KCRW on the radio. Um, yeah. So I'm here to talk to you tonight. I think the title was 5-MeO-DMT and Non-Dual Energetic Therapy. And I never really plan things out when I give talks. I just like to talk. Um, so I'll just start out by asking, how many of you are somewhat familiar with me and what I tend to talk about? I give a lot of talks about 5-MeO-DMT and non-duality, but I never know how many people are familiar with me. If so, about half of you. OK. Because, you know, if, I, if I'm in a room where everybody's like, yeah, we've, we've heard all your interviews, it's like, I don't want to just repeat the same stuff. Um, so I will cover both some general ground and then also the, the non-dual energetic therapy uh, issue. And hopefully leave time for questions. And just to warn you, I'm really a talker. If you ask me a question, I'm going to give you a full answer. So just so you know that... Um, yeah, you mentioned potty break. So let me know if you guys want to break at some point, because I'll just start talking. Uh, I love all the medicines. I I've n have yet to meet one that I don't like, but I've never tried Datura or Brugmansia or, or Nightshade, and I've heard a lot of you know, shady things about those characters. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had a, the, the pleasure of enjoying those, but uh, certainly, um, variety of both organic and synthetic molecules I consider to be very good friends and, and enjoy them all. My absolute favorite, beyond any question, any doubt, is 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO-DMT. Um, 
not necessarily if I want to have a good time. Uh, there's other things that I would rather enjoy. Uh, recently, over the past year, really, I've had um, you know, some opportunity to work with MDMA and find that, wow, I really, I really like that. That's really quite fantastic. Um, so I, I'm just going to stand up and move around because this thing is like squeaking here behind me. Um, but 5-MeO-DMT is unique in a way that other molecules aren't, they, they just don't touch what 5-MeO opens up. And one of the wonderful things about 5-MeO is once you've really opened up those levels within yourself through working with this molecule, is that it can change any other medicine that you might ever work with. So say you've had psilocybin mushrooms, and oh, that's great, you know, all the geometry and the pretty colors and the lights, and I'm just floating around out in outer space and all kinds of cool shit's going down. But, you know, I've never seen God. I've never, you know, maybe I caught a glimpse of oneness. But then, you know, you get an opportunity to work with 5-MeO-DMT, and all of a sudden, all those doors, they're open. And, man, they're kicked open. They're kicked open in a way that they're not going to close again. They've been busted open. And then someone goes back to something like psilocybin. All of a sudden, it's, whoa, it was six hours of 5-MeO-DMT. How is that possible? Um, so 5-MeO-DMT is just, it's far more powerful than anything else I've ever encountered. Um, I wrote a book about it over there, Being Infinite. That, so I don't want to tell you my whole story. I don't want to get into all of that, but just say that uh, over there is available my book, Being Infinite, that um, many people have asked me, like, well, how did 5-MeO-DMT change you? And it's like, okay, I, I wrote a book about it, so I can just, well, here's, here's the book, so you can read that. Um, but like, so I'll, I'll just share a little bit of my personal story with you. Um, I was, I got a phone call. I had, I had left, I had, was living in Santa Barbara and I left Santa Barbara and I moved up to Ashland, Oregon and uh, I was broke, didn't have any prospects for a job, didn't know what the hell I was doing, just knew that I was trying to, you know, follow my heart. I was being the, the good hippie, following my bliss. And Santa Barbara was great, but it wasn't there. So I, I ended up in Ashland, Oregon. And I was applying for jobs right and left. And one of them was at um, some indie record label in Medford, Oregon. And so I filled out this application. And after I turned it in, I get this phone call. And there's this guy on the other end. And he had looked at my personal website. And at the time, I had been going to Burning Man and running a theme camp there called the God Box. And the God Box was a mailbox that I had painted and put big eyeballs on and I put these big green feet on. And after I painted this box, I was like, well, it's like it's a mystic toad. It's a toad. It's a box and it's a toad. That's cool. Um, so I had this whole thing at Burning Man where you could come to our camp and uh, I would read you this oath. And then you had to sign the oath that you wouldn't tell anybody what's in the box. And then I would bring people what I called the Book of Confessions, and I had this whole big speech about how that, you know, this really is a God box. And you're going to go in there, you're going to open this box, you're going to come face to face with whatever's waiting for you inside that box. And so this is your opportunity to write down in this book anything that you feel you need to disclose before you go in and have this experience. Because this is a God box. This is the real thing. We're not just fucking around here. This is the real thing. And so then people would write in the Book of Confessions, and then they'd go into another dome, and we had like didgeridoo, a purification in the holy spritzer bottle, you know, tch -tch -tch -tch, spray people down. And then you would crawl into this, what we called the lair of the mystic toad. And there's mylar, and there's blinky lights, and you know, everybody's high, and they're going, whoa, shit, what's in there? And it's like, there's a, there's, there's a toad in there. And you go in, and you open this thing up, and then there's a little mirror in there. So you open up the God box, and there's a mirror reflecting you back to you. And I did that for a number of years. And so I had a picture of the God box on my website. I was like, yeah, this is my theme camp. And it says Mystic Toad. So anyway, this guy calls me up. So back up a moment. If you're not aware, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine is available through the venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. Now, I knew that. I had never experienced toad venom or 5-MeO-DMT at this point. Uh, but, you know, I, I heard about little licking toads, and I watched The Simpsons, so I've seen Homer lying around eh, licking toads and having his thing. 
Um, so I just called this thing the Mystic Toad, and you know, some people came by. I was like, "Oh, you you guys got toad medicine around?" He's like, "No, no, it's just a mailbox. It's just a mailbox." <laughs> anyway, so this guy calls me up, and he's like, "So, uh, what kind of Mystic Toad do you have?" I said, "Well, it's it's a mailbox. You can see that. It's on my website. It's obviously a mailbox. It says U.S. Mail right on the front." He's like, "Oh, well, I have a real one. Would you like to come over?" It's like, "Oh, okay." He said, well, you know, I'm trying to imitate my friend's voice. He's like, well, you know, it's uh, in agreement with James Orrock. My friend is always quoting everyone. So he had received an advanced copy of James Orrock's book, Tryptamine Palace, um, which wasn't yet released. It wasn't, wasn't out on Inner Traditions at that point. It was just a self-published book that was handed out to people at Burning Man. And so he had this, like, well, in agreement with James Orrock, I'd have to say it's a... It's a, it's a rocket ship straight into the heart of God. It's like, okay, sign me up. That sounds great. I don't believe in God, but man, give me the damn stuff and we'll see. Go ahead, do that. So anyway, I went over to his place and um, he gave me some toad venom. And something that I learned later was that you really need to use a, a large quantity of toad venom because it's only about maybe 15% 5-MeO DMT. And so he had some toads and he had milked the toads and he had a little bit. He's like, okay, here, I'm going to put it in there for you. And he had this really fancy vaporizer. It looked like something out of um, Terry Gilliam's movie Brazil, you know, with like weird parts of it. it reminds me, you know, um, what's his name? He's the guy, taxi driver. De Niro, yeah, De Niro, he's like the renegade um, air ducts um, repairman in Brazil. And that's what this device was like, like a balloon on. It's like, what the hell is this? So anyway, he puts the toad venom in there, and he lights up this vaporizer, and then there's this little balloon is contracting, suck that in, and he's like, yeah, just lie down. So, and he's, he instructed me to put my hands, he said, like, yeah, do it like that, you know, like Pharaoh style. I was like, okay, so I'm lying there. And... Um, it was nice, it was dreamy, um, at, and I always compare it to the fact that at the time, I had been doing a lot of work with Enhanced Leaf Salvia Divinorum. Okay, who here is a fan of Enhanced Leaf Salvia Divinorum? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's hard to see the hands. Uh, enhanced Leaf is where you take Salvinorin A and you extract it from the plant and then you uh, apply that back to the leaf so that you can smoke the leaf very small amount of leaf and get a very, very powerful salvia experience. Versus if you're smoking, say, just regular salvia divinorum leaves, you need to have a huge bowl of those things. And you, need to, you need to smoke it, smoke it, smoke it, smoke it, smoke it, and then clear out the bowl. It's like, just wait, just wait. And you got to pack more in there and you smoke it, smoke it, smoke it. And then like, <gasps> reality unzips and turns inside out a few times and then it like zips back up and it's like, whoa, what the fuck was that? Um, but with enhanced leaf, you just take one hit and whew, Okay, so I was used to that. And literally, I mean, if, if you're familiar with Salvia Divinorum, you know that I'm not joking when I say that the damn thing unzips, turns inside out several times as multiple layers of reality are filtering through each other, and then is doing this kind of thing, and then all of a sudden it goes zip, and you're back in the room. So that was my version of a really strong psychedelic that acts really, really quickly. Okay, so anyways, I got this little bit of toad venom, and it's just like, uh, really? This is your rocket ship straight into the heart of God? You, you, really? And so then afterwards, my friend's like, oh, okay, well, I, well, you didn't get enough. Sorry, we don't have enough. I saved a little, but that's for me, okay? So then he, <laughs> he had some. But then about a month later, he called me up and he's like, hey, I've got some good free base extract from, he's, he listed various plants. I don't know if any of that's accurate. I don't know if it actually was an extract or if it was just uh, synthetically made um, in the lab. Um, but it was free base, 5-MeO-DMT, which out of all the different versions of 5-MeO-DMT that are available out there in the world, this is the one that you need the absolute least of. You only need a very, very small amount of free base, pure, 99.9% .9 pure 5-MeO-DMT. And this time he had a new vaporizer that had like this glass piston and then you fill the chamber with um, argon gas and then you light it from underneath and then the vapor fills this chamber and then you suck, you know, there's this little you know, tube coming off and you suck and you can watch the piston go down. 
So my friend, it, some of you I know, some of you know my friend, and he's got this long ritual. It's like, oh, fuck, do I have to go through this again? Okay, so you get into this long ritual, and this big elaborate thing, da, 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 calling in the four dragon, and all this stuff is going on. And I'm like waiting, waiting. And, you know, then your, your heart rate is like boom, boom, boom. It's like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. And he, he's in perfect love and perfect trust. And he brings this pipe over, and it's got this piston, and I'm pulling this piston down, and, and I got to about right there. I did not get the entire hit. And it was, oh, my God. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And it was like 45 minutes of just pure thank you and holy shit, oh, my God, it was God. Now, I had been like a practicing Zen Buddhist for a number of years, and you know, Buddha mind, Dharmakaya, emptiness, blah, blah, blah. It's like, fuck that. This was God. <laughs> this was God. This was a being. It wasn't just some abstract, empty intelligence. It was a being that clearly was self aware, that clearly was infinitely intelligent, that had no boundaries, no edges and was pure, absolute, unconditional, endless, infinite love. And it was aware. And it knew it was everything. And therefore, it could love freely because everything was just it. It was, it was life in love with itself. And it was conscious. And it was alive. And then my ego said, what the fuck? <laughs> you don't even believe in this thing. <laughs> and that was my first full 5-MeO-DMT experience. And that was shocking, absolutely shocking to me. Um, for one, because clearly this was God. This wasn't, you know, this wasn't some dude sitting up on a cloud saying, no anal sex, nothing like that. <laughs> You know, this, this God doesn't care about your silly morals and rules and your books and your religions and your spirituality. I mean, all of that was just a joke because this is what my ego had trouble with because the damn thing was me. It was everything. And if it was everything, that meant it was also me. That means I'm God. And the ego comes back and says, oh, dude, no, that's crazy talk. What? You can't say things like that, you know, don't you know that's egotistical? I mean, there's all kinds of ways that the ego reacts to that. Or just, oh, you're just deluding yourself or whatever. But the certainty of that event floored me, that everything was God, including me, and that meant I was God. Because when the ego goes away, that's all that's left. There's just God. It's like, I am. I am infinite. I am love. <sighs> so... That really started this whole process, which is in the book, so I'm not going to tell you about the whole process. And kind of the various ways that my ego struggled with that and the releasing of pent-up energy, because also part of the story that I'm not going to get into is that up until this point, I had been living my entire adult life in a relationship that I was thoroughly unhappy in. And I made up all kinds of excuses for myself, especially as a Buddhist, like, this is so you can learn non-attachment to sexual pleasure, because you're not getting any, so <laughs> learn how to be non-attached. This is, this is very monastic for you. This is good for you in learning how to be compassionate and to not be attached to desire and things like that. Um, so I had a bunch of stuff that I needed to work out, because I had been in this relationship since I was 18, and so this was nine years ago now. And so kind of releasing all of that, and also at the same time, I was in touch with uh, Rick Strassman, and I, I actually got in touch with him after my second experience with 5-MeO-DMT, where the next night I was sitting in my apartment, just sitting and meditating, and I closed my eyes, and I noticed with my breath, I noticed like, oh, I could just go all the way, couldn't I? And then, oh shit, it happened, where I'm sitting there, meditating, and there's no 5-MeO-DMT, but all of a sudden, it just happened. And it was fully like I had just taken a hit of 5-MeO-DMT, and I was just, I was gone. 
And for the first 20 minutes or so, it was just fantastic. And then eventually this thought came in like, you don't know how to get back. <laughs> you don't know how to stop this. It's like, oh shit. And then I just started vibrating, <laughs> vibrating and shaking. So anyway, I got in touch with Rick Strassman the next day because I didn't know who to talk to. And you know, I know he's working with DMT. And by the way, I, I've since learned that NNDMT has no comparison to 5-MeO-DMT. I mean, they're not even in the same ballpark at all. This is nowhere close. But anyway, I reached out to Rick Strassman. He's like, oh, well, sounds like a good time for some ayahuasca. <laughs> you know, this, this is how we think in this field, right? <laughs> it's like, well, try another one. <laughs> so he hooked me up at the Santo Daime Church in Ashland. And so I started going and drinking Daime. And um, that was a kick. Uh, that was quite interesting. Um, for anyone, if you've ever been to Daime, you know that there's lots of singing and there's lots of dancing and these little hymns and you got these little dance moves and you got your little hymn book. And man, I went there and, and it's like, I got to get out of this room. And I'd, <laughs> I'd be out in the forest and I'm just out there, <laughs> and I'm just out there vibrating in the forest. And they were like, just leave them alone. <laughs> leave them alone. <laughs> And it was interesting because I saw other people, they'd go to Daime and they'd try and wander off and like all these people were coming up and no, no, come, 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 come back. And they knew, man, just leave Martin alone because he's going through something and we don't know what he's going through. So there's this whole process of opening up to energy and all this stuff. And then, then see, I'm, I'm telling you the story and I said I wasn't going to, but I can't help myself. Um, then like the third, you know, maybe it was the fourth time that I took 5-MeO, so this is now a few months into this process. Uh, God started talking, and that was really uncanny and very unsettling because I took 5-MeO and my ego just <laughs> dissolved, and then all of a sudden there's this voice speaking out of me, and it says, I am everything. And my body would do these things where like the left and right sides of my body would open up and move around. And then this voice would just talk. And it's talking, I live in your heart and I thank you. And this is rambling on and on. And then, it'd be, and then it'd, it would end about halfway through the 5-MEO experience. It would end and then like Martin Ego is back and then I, I, you know, I'm tripping really hard and I'm looking at my friend and the other people in the room is like, did I just say, did I say that? <laughs> did you hear me talking? It's like, oh yeah, we heard you. <laughs> and everybody else in the room is kind of like, whoa, what's going on with this guy? And, you know, the same thing would happen when I go to the diamond, so I just have to go out into the forest, you know, so no one would hear me talking and doing this stuff. Uh, long story short, after about a year and a quarter of going through this experience, and again, my ego struggling with the whole thing, the whole time, just what the hell is happening? Like, this is just crazy talk. That I thought I belonged in a mental institution at this point because <laughs> not only does this guy believe you can talk to God, but God's like using his body. And I'm, I'm, I'm having conversations because it see, the barriers started breaking down where it started happening just day to day. I'd be in my house and all of a sudden, all this energy would open up and then I'd get in, Martin would get into conversations with God. And it's kind of ironic, there's a guy, uh, Neil Donald Walsh, who lives in Ashland, he writes all these great books, Conversation with God. A really nice guy, by the way. Um, and I was like, this is fucking happening to me. This is crazy. This is, this, this is crazy. This is always my ego coming back and saying, this is crazy. And then, as, you know, in talking to myself, um, I ended up getting some 5-MeO that my friend got a new batch and he wanted it tested and my dad is a chemist and he's like, well, you give it to your dad to test it and see how pure it is and it came back 99.9% .9 pure and they said, oh, well, you can keep that. So I had a little bit, it was enough for maybe two or three doses and um, my friend said, oh, you can keep that, which is kind of a, for anybody of you who knows my friend, I know some of you do, you know, he doesn't do stuff like that, <laughs> so you can keep that. So he said, you can keep that. So anyway, I'm, I'm having these conversations with God, and God's like, yeah, take it all. And I'm like, no. No, 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 no. I'm going to die. That's way too much. He's like, no, no, take it all. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
So I had this little vaporizer, this little Canadian vaporizer, this funny thing you have to plug it in, and this little glass dome, and it's for pot. A um, little metal plate on there. So anyway, I put all that in there. I'm like, oh, that's good. Come on, keep going. And, you know, I screwed the top on. I plugged that thing in. And I tell you, I was convinced I was about to die. I was convinced that I was going to overdose or I was going to have a heart attack or I was going to go insane or whatever. But I, I didn't think I was going to make it through this. And it all vaporizes. And my heart is just pounding. And I'm just shaking and uh, trying to get to this thing. And I, I took the hit. And that was it. That was the end of my process. Because at that point, I was able just to fully surrender and just accept, oh, OK, this is just reality. God really is everything. And that means that I'm God, and everybody's God, and everything's God, and this moment is God, and that that infinite, bah, everything is going on with 5-MEO, that's actually, that's just what reality is. And everything else is just that thing interacting with itself. And at that point, it was like I was tripping 5-MeO-DMT for like the next three months. <laughs> Seriously, nonstop, except, so I teach at the university in Ashland. And this happened on a Friday night. And man, and see, I get all geometric, and I was like moving around the house. And, and I make all these sounds and stuff as all the energy is moving through. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get fired. I'm so going to get fired. <laughs> And I went to the university to teach class, and one of my students said, oh, hi, professor. And I said, oh, hi. I said, oh, that's the Martin voice. It's like, whoa, and I'm not high. This is interesting. So then I taught class, and I did the whole thing as Martin, which was really cool, because I didn't think it was going to happen. And then you know, I go home, and my wife said, so how was class? I was like, that was fascinating. And it, boom, and it explodes back open again. And so that was like the first three months. What dosage was that? That was probably about 40 milligrams or something like that. So it, it was a big dose, but it didn't even really feel that big because it was just like this was my new normal at that point. So anyway, so I'm getting to what we're, I'm here to supposedly talk to you about. Um, so then it was very shortly after this, so this was in the spring, is right before spring break of 2009. And then by that summer, I had secured my own supply of 5-MeO DMT. And then people started asking if they could do it with me. People started saying, well, can you, can you guide me through that experience? And this coincided with the, what became my first client. And that was my wife. Because at first, after, so I just cracked. Man, my eggs were scrambled. It was, I was just cracked. And at first, she was kind of like, oh, this is cool. But <laughs> then very shortly, my wife found that this guy she was living with was absolutely intolerable from her perspective. Just absolutely intolerable. Because for one, the person she knew as Martin seemed to be just gone. He wasn't there anymore. And in place was this dude who kept saying, yes, I am reality. <laughs> and then when she would try to involve me with ego games and projections, it would just bounce back and hit her in the face metaphorically speaking, that this guy would not play any games anymore. And then also at this time period, I have a podcast. Some of you probably know that. Maybe some of you listened during this time period. Old Martin got on the podcast. Well, Martin didn't get on the podcast. Um, we turned it over at that point. And I started pontificating on my podcast. And people were writing me emails like, dude, you're possessed by a demon. Fuck you. Fuck everything you say. This is, you know, oh. And so this is kind of, this is, my wife was going through this as well at, at this time. So it became really clear that either my wife needed to accept that this was just reality and this is just how things are and I'm not crazy and I'm not trying to pull anything over on you. But yeah, this guy actually knows who he is. 
and he's not going to fuck around about it anymore. He's not just going to pretend that, oh, I don't know, I'm some spiritual seeker and I'm open to all truths. Fuck that. That's not the way things are. When you know what reality is, there's no point in pretending that you don't know. And that's kind of intolerable for a lot of people, and my wife included. So anyway, um, I encouraged her, well, you know, why don't you take some medicine? And she had been to my friends, and she had had some experiences, and so she was familiar with that. But here's the key thing. What I learned was that if I gave her some, and if I took some at the same time that she took it, I could feel into her experience. That I knew when she was holding, holding on, or when she was just messing around with her ego, because I was there. And I also found, because she was really shy about it, she's like just taking a little bit, and like, oh, I does not want to take too much. Like, oh, it's so scary. I found, okay, then I'll smoke it. And, and we had so this HCL form, it doesn't vaporize well, so we were smoking it at the time. And so I found if I could take a hit, once she took a hit and had a little bit in her system, I could take more and she would feel it. So I would tell her, you don't have enough. <laughs> and then, oh, she'd open up. <laughs> and I found, and this is purely spontaneously, I also found that my body would naturally start to produce different sounds and that those sounds would open up the energy in her body and alter her experience. And, this is the last bit of the puzzle, is that I found that if I was here and she was there in front of me, and if there were no crossed limbs, that that was the most ideal energetic arrangement for doing this kind of work. That I could monitor her and then also push her through the experience. And, I keep adding more ands because they, they occur to me. Anyway, and that when we're in this nice mirrored relationship, see, I had done all this clearing out of my own body. So then this, this vehicle here just became clear. Her stuck energy would transfer from her body into mine and I could get it out. And then, then she'd feel better. She'd feel more open and more relaxed. So my wife, Jessalyn, was my first client, so to speak. So after working with her for a bit, then I found, oh, as people started to ask me, well, can I come do this with you? I was like, well, OK. So I started holding sessions with people at that point, summer of 2009. It was great. 5-MEO was still legal back then. Back in the good old days when you could take it without worrying about the feds coming to get you. Um, <laughs> and it kind of quickly escalated up until um, about a month ago, a little bit more than a month ago, I did my last session. And now I'm on break. Maybe retired. I don't know. Um, but over that time period, I did this usually between three and five times a week. Each session is generally two to three hours long. And usually taking three full rounds of medicine sh b shared between myself and the client. So at this point, I have taken more 5-MeO-DMT than anybody else that I know of anywhere, because that's a lot. I mean, that's like eight years of doing three full rounds of medicine anywhere from three to five times a week with clients. Always working one-on-one -on -one with people. In general, only one person a day um, on a, a special circumstances might do more than that. And before I tell you all about it, um, I'll just explain why it is that I'm at this point of not wanting to do that. I mean, you might start to get a feeling for why, uh, because I've done so much of it for so long. Um, but about two years ago, Almost exactly two years ago, I had a gentleman who had experienced 5-MeO-DMT with a therapist in the Bay Area. And he had heard, as many people hear, that, well, if you really want to go deep, go see Martin, because that'll be something that'll knock your socks off. So he's like, 
call. He sends me an email. Oh, I've heard so much about you. Can I please come work with you? It's like, oh, OK. Um, and this is one of the things that I tell people who have had 5-MeO DMT in another context, that I usually tell them, great, I'm happy that you have some experience with the medicine. Please understand that this is going to be completely and fundamentally different than anything you've ever experienced before, because this is not going to be what you've had before. Same medicine, totally different process. So anyway, this guy comes over. And um, OK, so uh, I'll, we'll come back to this. But one of my main guidelines is that people use bilateral symmetry in their body. This is very, very important for doing non-dual energetic therapy. Now, if you just want to party and have a good time, if you want to dance in the love of God, you can do whatever the hell you want. But if you really want to work, do the actual work, if you are interested in liberating yourself from your ego and from illusion and from attachment and a projection, you've got to be working with symmetry. Otherwise, you're just fucking around. So anyway, this guy comes over, he takes his hit, and he lies back on the mat. And about 10 minutes in, which is a kind of a crucial time period, that it, even if someone completely opens up from their ego, around 10 minutes in of a 5-MeO experience, the, the ego starts to reassemble, starts to come back in. And at first he was just lying there. And you know that's fine if someone's just lying there. But I'm usually looking that what I've found is that every session, there's something that that person's going to go through. And I guarantee you, it's not just lying there. There's something else, because there's an energy that's going to be released. There's going to be something big. And so I'm back there, smoking more. And then you know, I took a big hit, and then he started to react to that. About 10 minutes, his head started going back and forth. So I'm watching him, and I was about to do something about it. So the first thing I usually try is, with people is verbal coaching. And I'll just say, remember your symmetry, something like that. Sometimes people can hear me. Other times, I think it's probably like peanuts. You know, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, people did it. They don't know you're talking to them. And other times, I have noticed that people tend to ignore you because people are so full of themselves, they think they know what they should do. And it's like, I'm not going to take your advice. I do whatever the fuck I want. Anyway, I was going to say something. Or sometimes, if someone's moving, I might even just come up and like hold his head just so center him in the energy rather than this kind of flip-flopping back and forth. But anyway, his head started going like that. And then all of a sudden, his arm came up. He's like, no, don't show me that. I was like, oh, something's going on. And then he looked at me. And it was this look of, hello, I need to kill you. And it was, it was like that. I mean, I could see it in his eyes that this guy is like, oh, shit, he's going to try and kill me. And sure enough, he comes up and just, Bam! And he hit me as hard as he could, right here. And then I'm going to stop. Bam! He hit me as hard as he could right there. And then somehow, I'm not quite sure how, I'm on the floor. I had these two really big bruises on myself right here. So I think his knees, I think he had his knees on top of me. And he's just pounding me. He is hitting my face as hard as he absolutely can. My poor dog, Moxie. My session dog, Moxie, who just hangs out in sessions, she's like asleep on this couch. And she wakes up, and this dude's on top of me, punching me. He's trying to punch my head in. And then finally, I said the word enough. And for whatever reason, that clicked with him. And he's like, oh my god, oh my god. And he jumps off of me, and Moxie's rah, 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 you know, so I have to let the dog out, because she's freaking out. My whole face is swelling up. There's a huge cut on my lip. There's just blood all over the place. My face is swelling. Then the guy starts begging me. He's like, just put the gun to my head. Pull the trigger. Just do it. Just do it. Just kill him. Oh my god, just kill me. And I just kept talking. It's like, just sit here and breathe. Just relax. And he can't do it. He can't do it. So he ends up running downstairs. And his brother is downstairs talking to my wife. He's like, oh, I think I just really hurt Martin. Oh my god, I've got to go. So he like runs away with his brother. Now, this is getting hit. I mean, that was absolutely no fun. But the worst possible thing that can happen is you open up the energy and you don't complete it, which is exactly what happened here. So you can imagine, when he called me the next day back in San Francisco, I can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not real anymore. 
he's freaking out. Because really, you can't tell the difference between what's real and not real. I had no idea. Yeah, obviously. Um, so I talked him down after that. Um, so he had gotten into this delusional state, this ego projection state, where you know he's looking up at the ceiling and he said the ceiling was talking to him, and that in order to prove himself worthy of receiving divine love, he either had to kill the demon sitting across from him or let the de demon kill him. So of course he tried option A first, that didn't work. So then he went for option B, you know, please kill me. Now the point of my telling you this story, other than that there's lots of fun details, um, is that in working with people, I've always taken their energy on and processed it through my body. Ever since I first started doing this, that was just something that happened. And often in really weird ways. Okay, I'll tell you, like one of the first times, that one of the weird ones, this is way back in the beginning, woman comes over, and I don't know where we were, round two, round three, I'm not quite sure where we were in our rounds of the medicine, but she's on the mat. I'm on top of her, and my tongue is on her forehead, and I'm growling. And then all of a sudden I can feel it, it's coming, it's coming, and I just, and I threw up all over her head. Yeah. See, this is the kind of shit where the ego's back in there. My ego's like, dude, you can't do that. <laughs> you cannot throw up on this woman. That is so rude. It's like, no, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. So I threw up on her head. <laughs> this is what I've learned about throwing up on people. They're usually like, oh, yeah, oh. <laughs> you know? So I, I learned, like, really early on, my job as a facilitator here is simply to follow the energy and to embody it fully without reservation, without second guessing, without judgment. And if it means I need to throw up on someone, throw up on them. Just do it. Because they're going to appreciate it, as odd as it may seem. They will find value in that. So I've always been doing purging for people. Um, but generally, in working with clients, I found that it would be so most people would do maybe a minimum of three sessions with me. Um, and some people I've had do 10, 20 sessions, sometimes over the course of months, sometimes over the course of years. People keep coming back. Um, but very few people I've only done like one session with. I mean, it does happen if someone's traveling or just coming through town or whatever. But most people I do a number of sessions. They're progressive where you go from A to B to C to D. And it's interesting because I've had people come where they've maybe had 20, 30 experiences with 5-MeO DMT and they feel that they're stuck. And they come in from session one with me, they're like, oh shit, we're really moving now. And then we move through all this stuff. And somewhere in there, usually I'm purging for people. Anyway, after the puncher incident of this guy pounding my face, what I found is that um, perhaps for prophylactic reasons, uh, my body just said, you're going to throw up for everybody right away. Now, I've found that every single person who has ever come to me has got shit stored in their body. They've got stuff in there, energetically stuffed down within them that needs to come out. And I've had people come that they've spent years doing Vipassana, or they've spent years doing ayahuasca, or years working with 5-MeO, or years in the Native American church, or years Santo Daime, whatever. I've never had anybody come and just sit down and take medicine and like, oh, you can just be here. Fantastic, wonderful, nothing to do. That's never been the case. Every person has had layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of stuff to get through. And especially a lot of the people who work with ayahuasca and things like that, that usually the first comment when the session is done was, oh my god, that's been my issue my whole life and I've never gotten to it before. Thank you so much because we finally got there. Because it's just, it's clear. It's clear and it's powerful. You just get right to it and do it. But anyway, after the puncher two years ago, um, I started purging more for people. And it used to be that I'd like purge a little bit, but now it was like buckets and buckets of purging. So in the past couple years, I've lost like 30 pounds, which kind of looks good on me because I've always been kind of a chunky guy. Um, but I've lost a lot of weight over the past 
couple years as a result of this. Almost every single session, I lose whatever's in my stomach, I lose all of it in the session. And the client is like, oh, yes, thank you, oh, yes, which is great. I'm <laughs> Sometimes, not most of the time. Most of the time, the way that works is the person is lying down. They're kind of like spread-eagled like this. And OK, well, we can get into the details. <coughs> um, well, I'll answer the question first. I'm just thinking of what to say here. It's, I usually make it into the bucket. So leave a hand on a person, get the bucket, put the bucket down. Sometimes it just happens where I throw up on the person because that's what they need. Like another story, this is like the second time it happened, where I had this guy. I always tell people I don't do requests, but this guy, he's like looking at me, and he's like, can I lick your heart? <laughs> it's like, OK. So he kind of leans in, trying to lick my heart. He's like, no, no, I need you to lick my heart. And then he, he fell down. <laughs> and see, the e what I found is that people's ego often will try and draw you into their thing, whatever it is. That egos are just looking for playmates. And so they're looking for, hey, I've got a proposition. Do you want to play with me in this way? And so that's why I tell people, look, I don't do requests. But in this instance, this actually was genuine. He did need someone to lick his heart. So he's lying down, and I've got my tongue on his heart. <sighs> and then I can feel it coming, and then <laughs> right on his chest. The guy looked at it, and he's like, <gasps> it's a work of art. And then he like smeared it all over himself. <laughs> but most of the time, I'm not actually throwing up on people. Mostly, it's into the bucket. So. So I call all of this non-dual energetic therapy. Non-dual means, guess what? There's only one. There's only one. There's only one consciousness. There's only one being. I do not care what you believe. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your spirituality is. None of that makes a damn bit of difference to me whatsoever. There is only one being. I like to use the word God because it like, Prickles some people like, oh, don't say that. It's like, oh, it's like you know, the, the, the whole baggage of Western culture. And I don't want that. Say goddess or universe or spirit or source. It's like, oh, please, just get over your hangups. There's only one, okay? I'm going to call it God because it totally works for me. Um, and that one being is everyone, is everything. It's the words I'm saying right now. It is the thoughts that are processing in your mind. It is the breath you are just taking. It's the feeling of your ass on the seat. It's everything. Everything. And it loves to interact with itself because there's nothing else to do. This is one big oneness everywhere all the time. So, infinitely boring evolves itself into these little playmates and then is like, okay, let's, let's outfit you with an ego so that you won't know that I'm you, ha ha ha, then we can play. Okay, so the ego is our capacity for self-awareness that is facilitated through uh, the habitual use of energetic patterns that we develop starting at a young age in order to create ourselves as a character of who it is that we think that we are, how we allow ourselves to both experience and express ourselves. And we say, oh, that's me. I said that. I did that. I thought that. I like this. I don't like that. And it's all just a game. Because God's like riding out, you know, peeking out. It's like, ha ha, there's another confused one right here. I'm looking out through this one. Um, so I like to say that, look, there is one actor, billions of characters. And they don't, and none of them know who they really are. There's the, like, there's a few of them. There's a very, very small few of them that actually know, like, yeah, I'm God. It's cool. But most of them, they don't know. And see, this is why I think, like, religion is, like, really silly. Because, like, imagine, imagine a character. Okay, this is, this is the only one that pops into my head at the moment. So Jack Sparrow, right, Pirates of the Caribbean. Imagine if Jack Sparrow prayed to Johnny Depp for something. Johnny Depp would be like, dude, um, I'm you. Don't you know that? It's like, I'm you playing the character of Jack Sparrow. That's me. Okay, That's what reality is, that there's this one actor, this really, really good actor that can play billions of characters simultaneously. 
And that's all us. We are those characters. Um, and that in and of itself is totally cool. By the way, there's like a crack in your mug, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> um, and th there's nothing wrong with the characters, except for the fact that through our egos, we are constantly editing and censoring our natural energy and our natural desires, our natural thoughts, because we're all socialized. And you know, maybe that's a necessary thing, because otherwise, I mean, just imagine. I mean, uh, so I've got a toddler, three and a half year old. I mean, they all behave as though they're God, right? I mean, they all want everything to work the way they want it to work, when they want it to work, and if they don't get their way, ah, you know. I mean, if those little buggers, if they could throw like lightning bolts, I just they'd destroy everything. So, thank goodness, being God doesn't come with superpowers. We'd, we'd all would have been fucked a long time ago. But the ego, and I always use myself as an example. Right? I was in a relationship that I was thoroughly unhappy with, but I didn't want to be the bad guy. I thought that you know, being in a sexless marriage meant that I needed to devote myself to being non-attached and not concerned with desire. And so rather, see what I really felt, what I really felt was I am not happy in this relationship and I'm going to leave because I'm not satisfied and I'm going to go find something that will make me feel satisfied so that I can be true to myself and true to my heart. I didn't do that for like 16 years, right? I said, oh, I'll try and be better. I'll try and give you the things that you want and do things you want. Okay, that's the problem of the ego. So that we don't act on what we genuinely feel. Now, as a vehicle for God, you know, the whole energetic system, it's all set up. All, you, nothing you need to do, you just go with it that's all. But the ego, from childhood on, convinces us to play the characters that we're playing really, really well. And then we identify with that. And we think, oh, well, that's me. So the ego causes us to withhold and to edit. And this is why you know, people blow up and people uh, get completely disproportional when they finally do let their energy out and when they finally do express themselves. Or you don't say the thing that you want to say to your partner, so then you go down to the street corner and you, know, you get angry at the person who spilled coffee on you and you just blow your top at them because you didn't actually say what you wanted to say back to this person over here, so it comes out in other contexts. So everyone's got crap inside them. Um, now. When people go into full non-dual release, what always happens across the board 100% of the time, if they're actually going all the way, what happens is their bodies open up with this nice bilateral symmetry. And I first experienced this in myself, and then I was observing other people. I was like, oh, well, interesting. There it is again. And not only do they open up, but when people really engage themselves energetically at this non-dual level, that their bodies move like this, there's these undulating movements that occur where everything's kind of rolling around. And if someone's on the ground, that their feet will go up over their head. Man, I even had one guy one time where he somehow he flipped up over onto his head and then somehow he stood up. He's all whoop, back. This is the kind of thing he couldn't do if he tried, right? But he'd whoop, he just did it. So that, I've, I noticed this really early on that non dual experience, when it's unity experience, it's all God people always have this nice bilateral symmetry in their body. And then the flip side of that that I noticed was even people who go into these non-dual states, the second their ego comes back in, suddenly there's an asymmetry that occurs. I was like, well, that, that's kind of interesting. Why is that? And then I noticed it was across the board. And I also noticed people who failed to go into non-dual states that were still, you know, given 5-MeO-DMT, and they're still not going into a unitary state, they're in their ego, there's always asymmetries taking place. Always. Even if they're unconscious? Yes. So somebody could be not like in their conscious mind, but if there's asymmetry, then there's some sort of resistance? Yes, there's something going on. Something going on. So sometimes it's really subtle. Like someone might be lying down, and then after a little while, their head goes boom. And you know, they're non responsive, 
But man, it's because they're thinking about something and it's located over here. That's where they're storing the thought. It's over here. And then sometimes you can give people 5-MeO, like people who are like thinkers, people want to understand everything, people who are too intellectual, you give it to them and they're like, oh. and you can see, you can literally see them twisting around a place where they're holding on in their mind. Um, and this makes sense when you think about it, okay? I like to use this example. When someone wins a marathon, like they're running, they're running, and then finally they make it, they go, oh, oh. Their bodies open up with a nice bilateral symmetry. Why? Because they're not relating to subject object. They're just relating to the experiences of, oh, I won, I'm done, yay! Nice bilateral symmetry. And you can watch politicians do this too. When politicians, at least when they think they're telling you the truth, they will use bilateral symmetry. And then when they lie, they'll start to do things like this and like this. <laughs> Serious. You just watch them. Or when people, you know, very sorry to tell you, but your wife has died. You know, people will do this. They'll naturally go into nice bilateral symmetry in their body when they have something serious to tell you and when they're being honest about it. Um, now, versus subject-object relationships. So this is duality, what we're living in most of the time. If I want my water, my water is over here to my left. So I, subject, am going to engage with object, left hand. If I want my recorder, right hand. If I want to see Chet, over here to the right. I gotta look. Okay? If I want to see Ashley, I can look straight ahead, so then, then we can just vibe right in, right? <laughs> but subject object relationship is largely mediated through asymmetries that things are to the left or to the right. And then we all become left or right handed, most of us. Uh, most of the time, we get dominant sides. Um, Eyesight also is very important. When people go into a full non-dual state, they're either looking straight ahead, or their eyes cross, or their eyes are rolled up into their head, like that. Because they're just, oh, oh. OK? The opposite is the ego looks around and is like, oh, shit, it's over there. Oh, shit, it's over there, too. Oh, my, oh my god, oh, it's everywhere. The ego looks around. Or, oh, look at that. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, machine elves. Oh, I want to go over there. <laughs> Subject, object. Oh, it's deities. Oh, I want to dance with the goddess. Oh, I'm free. Oh, I'm free. I'll dance with the goddess. Subject, object, relationship. Okay? So, Non-dual energetic therapy means you've got to be engaging the body properly. Um, I call anything like this that has nice bilateral symmetry in the body. This is a neutral posture. Uh, some people like to give you 5-MeO-DMT and make you stand up, which is generally not a good idea. Okay happens to be a friend of mine, someone that I know, and uh, value, but uh, no, no, absolutely not. You should be sitting down or, or ideally lying down. Why not? Uh, because most people freak out and they end up falling down on the ground anyway, and so why not just start on the ground? <laughs> and then if you're standing, it's like, oh, I'm trying to stand and your legs are shaking that that becomes something to do. Now, one of the keys to working with the non-dual is don't do anything. Don't even breathe. So your body knows how to breathe. And this is one of the fundamental places that people hold on when you give them really powerful psychedelics, is they hold on with their breath. And <gasps> I can't breathe! I can't breathe! I need air! Just relax. Your body breathes on its own every night when you go to sleep. You don't have to do anything about it. See, the ego, the ego is a busy body. The ego thinks it always needs to be in control. And if it's not in control, it is doing something wrong. It is being a bad ego. And breathing is a big place where it does that. Um, but doing nothing means just completely surrendering and relaxing, not trying to figure out the experience. Some people also say, oh, well, go in with intentions and this and that, and that's something that I 
fundamentally disagree with. Your only intention is relax, trust, surrender, and pay attention. Stay focused. That's it. Whatever arises, whatever arises. But some people go in and it's like, oh, I want to fix my relationship with my mother, or whatever. It's like, oh, God, that's the ego. Don't you know that's the ego? It's another reason why when people would come to see me, I would never ask people like, why are you here? What do you want to work on? And some people, they want to tell you their whole story. It's like, oh, well, I've got this, and I've done that, and I want this. And it's just unnecessary because it's just the ego telling you, here's my story. These are all my illusions. Do you want to play along with me with these? Also, I don't do ritual. What a total waste of time. There's n you don't need any ritual. Oh, my God. Just sit down. Shut up. Take your medicine. That's all you need to do. Um, and then relax into symmetry. And ideally, you should have a body posture. So I would be lying down. I mean, standing up. Again, I don't re recommend that. But a body posture that says, I'm relaxed, I'm surrendered, I'm open, and I'm letting myself be vulnerable, and I'm embracing my experience. Versus this is, I'm symmetrical, but oh my god, I'm so terrified. Please, no. Right? So it's got to be open and relaxed. And then relaxed in the breath as well. Relaxed in the mind. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I mean, the little monkey mind is just endless. It's chatter, 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 chatter. I always tell people, no matter what you think, you don't have to do anything. Because this is one of the big ways that the ego operates. It says, don't you know you need to do this right now? Yes, right now. And then convinces the person, oh, I've got to do this right now. You don't have to believe anything that your ego tells you. Every time you say should or should not, that's your ego talking to you. The real question is, what do I feel like? And then you operate from there, not what I should, because should is part of the editing process, part of the process to tell you, you do this, be this way, don't be that way, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, nice, relaxed, open. Uh, body posture. Um, but staying in this, okay, some people, they have an easier time and boom, they can just go right in. Other people, oh man, squirmy wormies. Uh, sometimes people might take many sessions before they can even hit the point where they can just relax and be present in it. Some people react, it's the most horrible experience of their life because you know, if you're really going all the way, it feels like you're dying. And I always tell people that your ego has a choice at that point. Your ego can say, hey, I'm dying. Cool. Let it happen. Bring it on, baby. I'm ready. Or the ego says, no, I'm not ready. I'm going to hold on. And then it becomes terrifying. It becomes horrible. It becomes very, very difficult for someone. But many people have a lot of trouble just relaxing and being able to stay in it. And then other people who have a really great time, but they're indulging. And they're fucking around, and you can see it. They get their 5-MEO, and then all of a sudden they're, <gasps> ah, and they're dancing around, and they're, and they're doing this asymmetrical stuff with their hands, and they think they're moving their energy, and it's like, oh, I can't tell you just how intolerable that is. It's just stop. Just stop. Oh, please, just stop. And I tell that to people, please stop. <laughs> and then when they do, then the energy starts. Then you can start to work with them and start to process their energy. And everybody's got processing to do. And so what I tell people is as soon as you become aware that you're doing something, go back to doing nothing. Because people can't help themselves. You know, that, that oh, they're doing their thing. Oh. Whoa, OK. Go back to doing nothing. Or sometimes people are screaming and crying and thrashing about, and once you become aware, oh, I'm screaming and crying and thrashing about, then you go back to doing nothing. And sometimes it takes many times working with people before they can reach that point. OK, so now I'm getting back to the question that you asked earlier about, well, do, you, do you always throw up on them? Um, so the way that it works is that once someone has reached a point where they're relaxed, centered, trusting, and open. And they might have had a lot of energetic releases. There's different kinds of ways people release energy. There's laughing, screaming, crying, babbling in tongues, throwing up, purging, uh, water gushing out of their mouths, orgasms, going to the bathroom, all different kinds of things. 
But then people always, there's more work to be done. So this is where I come in. This is how I work. Once someone is lying down, then I can start to work on them. Um, and when they're relaxed and open. Um, through the ego, through the asymmetries of the ego, people get knots that reside along the center line of their body. And then they can be anywhere along here, and generally they're interconnected. So this is just a very, very vague, very, very general. People who think too much, they're stuck right up here, always. Um, people who have trouble expressing themselves and being genuine and saying what they really think and feel, they tend to get stuck around in here. People who are afraid of their hearts or who have been wounded or are guarded in their emotional nature and they kind of keep their heart in a prison, they're usually stuck right here. The vast majority of humanity is stuck right in here in the abdomen because this is where we are digesting our experience of reality is right in here and this is where people get afraid and where they hold on and it's right in here. People who are unsatisfied or disconnected from their physicality, from their bodies or their sexuality, they get stuck down in here. Obvious reasons why. Um, so, the way that it works for me when I'm working with a client, and by the way, just to complete a thought that I don't think I really completed before, ever since the puncher and the deep, deep throwing up that I was doing for everyone, it was almost every time, and it's been nonstop for the past two years, and so I reached a point where I decided, like, look, I need to take a break, so I'm officially on break now, and that also, I've spent a lot of time talking about non-dual experience in 5-MeO-DMT. I have not really shared about what it means to work with people in this capacity for obvious legal reasons, because it's illegal. 5-MeO-DMT is illegal. But now that I'm not doing it, I can say, well, this is what I did, <laughs> okay, rather than what I do. <laughs> but anyway, when someone's then, they're down. Um, most of the time, it's just like a magnet, because what we're doing is we're working energetically as one unit. And I can feel there's something uncomfortable here. So when I take that first hit with a client, what happens is it goes, it gets really, really big, really, really fast. But then for me, it kind of hits the ceiling where it's, oh, OK, you're holding on. I can tell because I can feel it. See, if, if the client doesn't have anything to hold on to, they go infinite and I go infinite. And it's just all infinite. There's not me and a client there anymore. It's just, woo, one, yeah, baby, infinite. But most of the time, that's not it. It gets big, and then I can feel like, oh, you have a wall. You're holding on to something. You, there's something you don't trust. There's something that you don't want to address. There's something that you're not feeling. So then we've got to dig in there and find what it is. And then it's kind of like a magnet, where when the person is ready, I just end up right on top of them. So they're usually like spread out like that. And what I'll do to start is I usually come in, and I crouch between someone's legs, and I start just by putting my hands on their abdomen, usually right along the center line of their body. And some people, their bodies react immediately when I touch them, that they start convulsing and they start going into gyrations and energy starts moving. Other people, they make me dig for it because they're trying to hide it. They don't, they don't want to face it. They do. They want to face it or else they wouldn't be here with me. But Another part of them is terrified and doesn't want to deal with it. And I'll tell you, sometimes it is so close to the movie Alien, it's just fantastic. <laughs> because I put my hands on them, and what happens is their pulse comes up, and then their pulse moves up their body or down or to the left or the right, or it tries to hide, and I'll follow it. And then when we hit the spot where the person is holding on, that thing just comes alive, and it's there's, there's, there's this stuff moving around. And I've had people ask me, like, oh, is there an alien inside me? What's going on? And I also, t I warn people from the beginning, it's like, when, when I find the spot where you're holding on, I just want you to know that it's generally going to be very physically painful. It's going to be emotionally very, very challenging. It could be mentally just tumultuous of all kinds of material coming up. And it's very, very hard. And I tell people that the best comparison I have to this is giving birth that this is going to be like giving birth, and it is not going to be easy at all. So anyway, their pulse shows me. And then once the energy engages, then I would generally start to make all kinds of sounds. And I tell people, I click, I purr, I growl, I tone, I whistle, I do this kind of weird, you know, it's kind of like this speaking kind of thing that's just all coming out. And I always tell people, look, because people ask, like, oh, why did you sound like a bird, and then a bear, and then an alien? It's like, 
look, it doesn't mean anything. It's all I'm doing is I'm using my body to express the energy as it is. So there's no, there's no birds or bears or insects or aliens here. It's just the energy sounds this way, and I'm helping release it and move it. So this, I mean, it gets really, really weird. So a person's lying down, and I'm on top of them, and I'm growling and purring, and then usually I'm making kind of, you know, these weird faces. And then you can feel like, here it comes. So I usually leave one hand on the client, reach over, get the bucket, and then blah into the bucket and then get back and put my hands back on them and then keep going more and then I can feel there's still more in there so I go back there and I take a hit and they hear me taking a hit and they think oh yeah I want more too and they sit up and they're like oh shit I feel that one and boom and they're back down and I'm back on top of them and then so this was this is like every time doing this this is why I stopped because it's just exhausting and then and then there'd be other ways to process energy where you know sometimes I've you know I'm holding their toes and my feet are up in the air like this and we're moving the energy and then it's all coming through them and coming out my feet and they're looking up and they're, ah! you know, it's just crazy. It's absolutely, totally crazy. I mean, it's the kind of stuff where, I mean, if I thought about it, it's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> this is so weird. It's so weird. And then people tell me that, that when they look at me when, when we're doing this, they're like, See, their ego goes through all these dualistic projections. So they're like, well, you look like me, and then you were my dad, and then you were my mom, and then you were my lover, and then you were my brother, and then you were an insect, and then you were like a bear, and then you were Jesus, and then you were God, and then you were a devil. And then and this is, and like their minds go through all of this stuff. And then people routinely tell me, it's like, I couldn't tell if I was you, or you were me, or who was who, or it was all God, or what. And it's just, it's unbelievably confusing for people and at the end usually people would be like wow oh my god most people would tell me that's unbelievable this is unbelievable but how did you do that it's like well this, this is just the way that it works okay it's just the way that it works and especially people who've had 5-MeO in another context that that the, all of them their reaction is how do you do this this is impossible you shouldn't be able to take 5-MeO and focus and work on someone in this capacity. It's like, well, look, I've just accepted that it's me, so it's not a problem for me, and it's easy. It's not necessarily easy, but it's not, it's not difficult. And even when there's all the purging, I actually I don't feel sick. Um, it's just stuff coming out, and it's just stuff to do. And every time it comes out, you can see the person, they're, they're feeling better and better. And I've had people where they're just, they're scared shitless at the beginning, and then by the end, they're just, they're free, and they're open, and it's just so beautiful, and it's just, it's amazing. But anyway, the point being is that this is all stuff that I want to share more about, because the way that I approach this, the way that I work, from what I'm able to understand is fundamentally unique. I don't know if anybody else anywhere who works this way energetically with people I've never seen or encountered anything for people who work with 5-MeO to do anything that's even remotely close to the way that I work with people. And that's just been confirmed for me by people who have experienced um, 5-MeO from other contexts. And I'm not trying to put anybody down. I mean, it's a great medicine. You can get a lot just by t taking the medicine and having experience. But what I've learned is that there's a potential there. And this potential, it doesn't just apply to 5-MeO, this applies to all medicines. There's a potential to use these as tools specifically for the purpose of what I'm calling non-dual energetic therapy. Every person on this planet has the disease of the ego. So it's universal. Everyone's got this issue. And it creates physical, mental, and emotional problems for people. Therefore, everybody could benefit from some form of non-dual energetic therapy. And this is much more direct than, say, meditating or following a spiritual practice. Again, I, I've worked with people who have spent 40, 50 years meditating. And then one session, they're like, oh my god, this is, this is so far beyond anything that I've experienced before. So I think that there's a radical potential there. And when used in this capacity, okay, many people when they when they 
are lucky enough to experience 5-MeO-DMT that they say, oh, well, I had an, an experience of enlightenment. Because that's what it is. It's an experience of enlightenment, meaning just the full non-dual nature of being, no ego present, it's all just infinite, it's all love, it's all one. But you see, 10 minutes later, clink, 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 the ego is back. And maybe there's been some processing and there's been some releasing, but then the ego comes back. And then some people glide for the next couple months where they just, they just feel like, oh, everything's amazing, it's amazing. But then a couple months later, it's like all those pieces are back in place again. And like I said, I, I've worked with people who've had 5-MeO in other contexts, and they've come to me thoroughly stuck. Where it's like, it's great when I take 5-MeO, but there, there's no progress. I'm not getting anywhere. Um, and so this mode of operating allows people to move progressively. And the potential is that this can be a process to move people to what I call liberation, where you actually are free from the ego, which doesn't mean the ego's gone. I always advise people, getting rid of your ego will help you to be enlightened about as much as chopping off your hands. Getting rid of your ego doesn't do anything for you. The problem is that we identify with the ego. We identify with the energetic structures of the ego and the character of the ego, and that's what causes problems. The ego itself is not a problem. Ego is just fine. It's no more problem than anything else but it's through our habitual, unconscious use of it. So ideally, this is a process of becoming ever more self-aware. And then that translates into becoming ever more responsible for yourself, that you, your ego is a prison, and you've put yourself in the prison because you think you should be there for whatever reason. And you're the gatekeeper on the other side of the prison as well. All of that's you. Because that's also the big non-dual reveal, is that guess what? Everything that's ever happened to you, you did it to yourself. Everything. You are responsible for everything you've ever experienced. And at the very least, for how you reacted to it. Because just because everything is one doesn't mean like, okay, I'm going to use my mind and lift that cup right off the table right now. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Um, but it's up to me whether I get upset about how the cup is used or, oh, you did that wrong, or the wrong color person picked up the cup, or whatever it is. All of that is up to you and your own attitude. So learning how to move beyond that, how to free oneself from the confused identification of the ego, actually does move someone towards enlightenment, genuine liberation, genuine enlightenment, not just an enlightenment experience where for 10 minutes it's like, everything was great, and then, oh, it's, and you see this sometimes, people cry when they come back from 5 a.m. It's like, oh, I don't want to be back in the world. Oh, I want to go back to that. It's like, that is all the time. You don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> Because there's nowhere to go, because that's all that's actually ever happening, and that we're just parsing it out into me and you and this and that and the other thing. But that oneness, it's, that's all that there ever is. And in moving into genuine liberation, there is an ease and a relaxed nature within. See, everyone's heart is guarded. People have got these castle walls and bobbed wire and machine guns and turrets and they're keeping their hearts like, well, I'll let it open a little bit for you and, oh, you hurt me, oh, fuck that, I'm going to close it back up again. Where you can get to the point where it's just, ah, oh, oh, my heart's open and that feels so good and so relaxing, I'm never going to close it again. And nothing you can ever say or do to me, I don't care if you stab me, I don't care if you blow me up, I don't care if you kill my family, it's not going to close my heart because I love you because you're me and I love myself. So bring it on because it's just open. That is genuine liberation. And that brings a sense of peace and wellness to individuals, which then can ripple out into society. The only reason we kill each other and go to war is because of those other people over there doing that to us, which is all ego. Every war that has ever been fought has been fought over the ego. That's the only thing people ever fight about. That's it. Other than maybe the, your slice of cake is bigger than mine. But see, that's still ego. It's like, oh, I want more for me. So every religion, political system, ideology, 
all forms of identification, they're all problematic. All of them, all cultural identities, spiritual identities, all of them, they are all problematic. Which doesn't mean we need to get rid of them. It's just about learning how to disengage from them and understand, oh, it's a part of me, it's not me. I don't need to get all upset about that part of me, that I can live with that part of me. And that that becomes transformational for people. And I think that that is the ultimate potential of psychedelic medicines. And these conditions that I'm talking about, about using symmetry and balance and the ways that you work with the energy, this applies to all the medicines if you want to use them for non-dual energetic therapy. Now, if you want to take mushrooms and see pretty lights and go dance around, go do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to get to the root of what is causing you your whatever, you have got to lie there and be still and do nothing. And then you'll see, sooner or later, it's like, I've got to get out of this chair. I've got to move. Why? Because you're uncomfortable. Why? Because there's something there that you don't want to process, you don't want to look at, you don't want to deal with. Man, it draws people out. The ego draws people out consistently. And until you reach the point where you can take as many psychedelics as you want, and you can just sit there. If you can't do that, then there's something to work on because there's something making you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I like to do with people. Ideally, it's just, we're just going to take some really, 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 really powerful psychedelics, and we're just going to sit here, and then we're going to see how, how much you squirm. And then we're going to bring your attention to why you're squirming and how you're squirming and how that is unconscious and how you're not aware of what it is that you're doing. So that you need to become aware of it. And, okay, I'm going to sit here. <laughs> okay, so relax your breath. Trust your breath. Nothing you need to do. Oh, 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 stay focused, stay focused. There's nowhere to go. Stay right here. And it's about fine-tuning people. So these are the things that I want to share. These are the things I want to talk about because I don't see other people doing this. And I don't see this. Mostly what I see in the larger psychedelic community is a lot of indulgence in dualistic fantasy. And grotesque metaphysics and artificial spiritualities and all kinds of stuff that is just misleading and is unhelpful. And um, I see people indulging their egos with psychedelics of, oh, well, I'm a shaman and I've developed, this is my spirit guide and I'm in contact through these ceremonies. And it's bad. It's all an act. It's all the ego just acting. And, you know, if you want me to sit back and, oh, <laughs> bravo, good show, I'll do that. But, it, you know, when people come forward, it's like, oh, well, I'm this shaman and I'm channeling this past life and all this. It's like, oh, fucking get over yourself. Don't you know you're God? You're just God. You've always been God. You're God right now. You always will be God. Whatever narrative it is, you think about your past lives and your spirit guides and your ascended masters. You're just masturbating and you're trying to make us applaud you for masturbating over your ego. Oh my goodness. Please, it's so much more fun just to be clear. To let go of the need for story and identity and this and that and the other thing. And I'll just stop talking and I'll let you ask questions because I have a little bit more time. Yeah. Okay. Um, one potential adverse effect is that somebody might just die. Um, what I've learned is that the medicine itself does not increase heart rate, but sometimes the person's excitement and nervousness does dramatically. But it's not, it's not dose dependent, because someone who's really relaxed, you can give them a big 5-MeO dose and there's no noticeable increase in heart rate. But other people, their heart is just <laughs> So if someone has a heart issue, you know, there could potentially um, be a heart attack. Um, also, when people really go deep, it's very common for people to stop breathing for short periods of time. So there is the potential that someone might not start to breathe again. Like I'll, I'll tell you, there was one time I had this woman who was 79 years old, 
And out of all the people that I've worked with, she seemed the closest to like, ooh, whoa, she's really going. And the way that, because she, she wasn't breathing, and she was just lying there, and what happened was is I ended up lying down on top of her. And I know this sounds odd, so you don't have to tell me this sounds odd. <laughs> so I put my tongue in her mouth. And I pushed against her tongue, and there was no push back. And I was like, oh, OK, you know, this, is, this is serious. And so then I just waited with my tongue up against the tip of her tongue. And after a while, she suddenly pushed my tongue out of her mouth. And I was like, OK, she's going to be fine. But that, for me, that was the session that I felt was the closest to someone like, where she's really just going to go. And I think that there's always that potential. Um, I think in most circumstances, it's not really a realistic concern. I think most people are going to be fine. Um, but certainly when someone's like 79 and coming for this work, that that's something that I, it makes me a little edgy, like, oh, wow, you're kind of old to be doing this, and this is like really serious, big stuff. Um, if people have a difficult time distinguishing between what they think and what's real already, it might exacerbate it. Not even necessarily psychotic, but yes, if they are psychotic, it could potentially exacerbate it. But even people who are you know, at this social level that they're very functional, we wouldn't necessarily classify them as psychotic. But people who also who misinterpret other people's comments or interactions with them, like they get really upset, like, oh, well, you just totally offended me. It's like, oh, I didn't do anything. That's, that's someone who's living in their mind, and they're reacting to what's going on in their mind. That's someone who potentially is going to go way overboard with that. Now, what I have seen is that t at times at mental events like that, sometimes because what happens is, especially when you're resting in cemetery, is that it's going to bring the deepest stuff. It's going to allow that to come to the surface. Sometimes that then needs to subsequently play out over social interactions over a period of time. So there might be a period where it seems like someone's doing much worse. It's like, wow, I thought Joe Blow was crazy before. He's batshit nuts now. But then there usually comes a point where then they swing around where suddenly they realize, this is me. I've been doing this to myself. And, but it needs to be exacerbated before it resolves. So sometimes it can make people a little bit crazier um, beforehand, but then eventually swing back. Overall, the worst is when someone has had any energy arise within the situation that has not been completed in some capacity. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to bag on anyone, but I have worked with now many people from around the world who have had 5-MeO-DMT in the context of another provider providing them with the experience that did not know how to work with their energy that arose within it. And so that person was incomplete. And they come to me and they're just, they're shaking and they're crying and there's, I did it a year ago and I haven't been able to sleep since. And, ah, and they're, just, they're just a mess. And then that requires a great deal of work on my part to help them through that. But once they get through that, then they just feel infinitely better. So if someone has not been well served, that that can potentially be a very big issue. So the, one of the things I would always tell someone, if, you know, if you're looking to take 5-MeO with someone, someone who's providing that for you. I have two categories. I have providers and practitioners. I'm the only one that I know of that qualifies as a practitioner according to my standards. Everybody else is a provider. But you observe them. How is this person's energy? How does this person react when things get difficult or challenging? That you should spend time observing someone first and then decide, do I want to put myself in your hands or not? And you know, start with that. And that it, it makes a big difference how someone administers the things that they do. Um, and ideally, someone, this weird term of holding space, it just holds space for me. If someone can hold space well, that, that's probably OK. But sometimes people get ideas that they're going to be really active in doing things for you during the experience. And a lot of times, it's just kind of make-believe stuff that they're doing, and that it actually might create more issues for the person. Um, but other than these concerns of potential heart issues, mental issues, of energy being incomplete or being un, not served well, you know, 99% of the people that I've ever worked with um, feel it's been the most profound, beneficial thing for their life. Um, so that, you know, there are 
concerns, but overall, I think that the, the benefits, the potential for benefits far outweigh um, concerns. Did I answer all the parts of the question? Kind of. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about the people for whom it doesn't go okay. Like, is there, are there non-happy endings, you know? Yes. Um, not so much with me, um, because I usually insist, you know, it's always up to the person, but if, for me, what I see is every session has a natural arc. And that once you get to that arc, it doesn't matter how much more you take after that, but you've got to get there, or else the person's going to leave unfinished. And so that's one of my main priorities in working with people, is that we're going to get to that, and then after that, everybody feels great. So the exception was when I had this guy try and kill me, and that he left without that being completed. And then I've, other, I've had a couple other people that were just so full of their egos. Like I had this one guy, <laughs> oh, this Japanese guy, um, who felt he was already enlightened. And so he, <laughs> he, he wouldn't relax and open up. And so I, I, I tell people, here's a rule of thumb. If I can hear you breathing, I can hear your ego. Because when people are not in their ego, they're just, and when they're in there, you go, <laughs> and so this guy, he kept grunting. He said, and I kept telling him, I can hear your ego. He's like, you're bringing me out of it. Stop it. I, said, I can hear your ego. You know? And so he kind of left by like, oh, namaste, like trying to pretend like, oh, okay, bow to you. But I could tell inside, he's just like, oh, fuck you. You totally ruined my experience. Um, so you know, he had kind of a negative experience. but. Um, no, you can make noise, but there, there's a difference between there's the genuine thing and then there's indulgence. And you can hear the difference mm -hmm. if you're paying attention. Um, it's, like, it's like with screaming. A lot of people scream, but you can hear. There's a point where it's just like, oh, yeah, that's the real scream. Let it out, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can hear suddenly, oh, you're screaming because you just became aware that you were screaming. And if you stop screaming right now, that that would be admitting to yourself that you don't know why you were screaming just a couple seconds ago, so you're screaming to save face. Okay, and you can hear the difference. It's very subtle. And so there's different ways that people do that. So what I always tell people going into a session is that, look, if I hear your ego indulging, I'm probably going to call you on it. That I might let you do that for a little bit, but if it becomes excessive, that I'm going to call you on it, and it's your job to trust that I'm telling you that. But sometimes egos don't want to hear that, that people are like, no, I. I know, I know, don't tell me that. Um, but other times it can snap people out. Like I had one guy come over several years ago, an uh, older gentleman, and he went into this whole thing. You know, he took his hand and he's like, oh, we Jews have always suffered for God. We've, oh, why must we suffer so? And man, that just so set me off. I just, I came and I just sat right on his chest. And I just looked right in his face, and he had his eyes closed. He was like, what do you suffer for God? And I just got, I got this close, and I said, do not bring that kind of bullshit into my house. And he opened his eyes, and he looked at me, and he's like, oh, you're right, I'm so full of shit, oh my God. And then, he like, and then he threw up, and then he went into this beautiful state. But sometimes you need to call people on that. See, but the ego tendency is that the ego wants to try and make people comfortable and doesn't want to challenge people. So that's why the practitioner needs to be willing to put themselves in that situation. That, look, your ego is indulging here, so I'm going to confront you for your benefit. I mean, this is done out of love, but it might get difficult. But sometimes you need to tell people, you're full of shit and you're doing it right now. And then they can move beyond that. But the problem is that in most day-to-day -day interactions, nobody calls anybody on their shit because we're all socially conditioned to, to oh, that's fine, or oh, no, I'll deal with it later, or whatever it is. You know, we don't, we're not honest. And so this is all a practice of learning how to be honest. Be honest with yourself. Inside, outside, there's no difference. Be honest, be honest, be honest. And the more you can do that, the more you are in alignment with genuine energy, and then the easier the experience becomes. But when people have big narratives, that, that, that can be hard to, to overcome that. Um, another aspect that's difficult is that when you're really doing this, um, most people come away with then viewing their 
aspects of their spiritual or religious tradition as being nonsensical, whereas before they might have seen it as really meaningful and valuable. And that can be difficult for people, especially at the social level, where then suddenly, oh, what, you don't want to go to church anymore? Just talking to myself. You know, so it can be difficult for relationships. And also, I've found that when I do a session with one half of a couple and not the other half, almost always the relationship breaks up. Because one person is going through the most profound thing they've ever had, and the other person isn't. And a lot of people are in relationships that aren't really serving them anyway. They're, you know, like me, I was in a relationship that there was no reason for me to be there. And once you confront that, it becomes more difficult. So that's kind of a counterindication. And also, <laughs> I tell people that this is kind of Pandora's box. Everyone has got lots of deep stuff they're hiding inside them. And once you open it up, you cannot just put the lid back on the box. So you need to be committed that I'm going to go through my shit. And if you're not willing to do that, just stay away. Don't do it. Don't open the box. Um, and be prepared that you might suddenly realize that you need to change everything about your life because you're being totally inauthentic and not true to yourself. And so it can put a lot of, you know, that can be stressful. You know, I was fortunate that I went through this at a time that I had just left my wife and my job and everything. And so I was in a state of flux. So I, and I didn't know anybody in the new community that I was at. So nobody knew what I was supposed to act like anyway. So like the weird, freaky guy is out vibrating and throat singing in the forest. He must be doing that all the time, you know. But for other people, it can be hard for them to go through that um, as other people react to that. So it's not easy. It's not challenging. And, and like I said earlier, when I was going through this myself, I really thought I was going crazy, that this, this is insane, this God thing going on, that you're totally insane. So it's not easy. It's really it's hard. But oh, it's so worth it. Anyway, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. And it was, it was honestly that important. You know, I, I chalk up my full release on Phi Mio, birth of my first son. They're just incredibly meaningful and wow, you know. Um, but my question is, is, you know, I feel like this is a basic human right that we're being denied. Yeah. And what is yeah. it going to take uh, to make it like alcohol? Like, for instance, if someone wants to go to a bar, you can go to any bar. What, when, when will, when, uh, what is it going to take, I guess is the question. Well, I wish I had the answer to that. Well, you're God. <laughs> 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 ah, but, see, part of that is recognizing that actually you don't have control over anything. And that that's part of the game. Part of the self-created game is that you don't know what's coming next. If you knew what was coming next, there'd be no point in playing the game. That'd be really, really boring. And so no one knows the future. I do think that we're moving towards it. I think that part of what it takes is really vocalizing what you're saying very clearly. Um, I'm going to start writing another book pretty soon, and that's actually exactly what I want to start with. That This is a fundamental human right. Every human being on this planet should have the right to know who and what they are. And I think that 5-MEO is the most ideal key for helping people have that experience. And that anyone who would deny you that right is messing with your rights. And, but you see, even there, we're still dealing with the land of duality. Because right is an invented concept that doesn't exist out there anywhere other than that we agree on that that's part of our social contract in this country, that we say, oh, well, people have rights. And then we have duties, and we have responsibilities, that that's, that's our legal framework. But you know, in other cultures where they don't have the concept of rights, that that's a foreign concept. So, it's still a construct, but I do think um, that part of it is the non-dual argument. That if we really are all God, which I contend that we are, and that most people don't know that, and that knowing that and relaxing into that makes them better, happier, healthier people, that that can kind of sway the cultural dialogue, because there's still, I mean, we can see things moving now where, oh, well, 
it's good for PTSD, they're good for depression, it's good for maybe helping you quit smoking cigarettes. And so we're kind of chipping away at a lot of these issues through MAPS and these other organizations that are showing therapeutic uses of psychedelics and that use in conjunction with therapy, you get a lot of good benefits. How about full and complete total knowledge of self? How about liberation from illusion? That that's something that's not discussed in the literature or out in the field too much because most people are either dealing with shamanic dualities or they're looking at more limited therapeutic uses. So part of it is just kind of making some noise around this issue. It's like, hey, guess what, everybody? You're God. You have a right to know it. Here's a tool that helps you experience that. Um, but even there, you know, it's difficult. I certainly have found um, in my own advocating of this position that there's been a lot of pushback within the broader psychedelic community. And part of it is the way that I go about it. You know, I'm not exactly nuanced. <laughs> um, but that, that's, that's part, you know, it's like, you know, I don't mean to harp on Terrence McKenna, but he's just, he's just an easy example because everybody knows him. It's like, you know, he, he smokes DMT and he's like, oh, wow, machine elves in 2012, and this is the heart, this is the main thing everybody's got to get, this is so amazing, versus smoke 5-MeO DMT and experience God. Which sounds more profound to you, machine elves or God? <coughs> I don't think it's a big choice. I think it's pretty obvious. And so, and still, even in the psychedelic communities, a lot of people are really uncomfortable with the word God. I and mean, I kind of made fun of that earlier, that people say, oh, well, can't you just say source? I mean, I've, had, I had, I've had people tell me that. People write me email. I'm really uncomfortable with the way you use the word God. I mean, can't you just say source or universe? It's like, no, get over it. Don't make your problem my problem. You have a problem with the word God. That's your problem. It's not my problem. I'll always use the words that I want. But even there, there's a lot of discomfort in the psychedelic community in talking about non-duality. That, you know, when pe people talk about their past lives experiences or whatever, nobody blinks. It's like, oh, well, you must be enlightened. But then you have somebody come along, like me, as a radical non-dualist who says, you know, you don't have any past lives because you're God. You're every life that's ever been and every life that is right now, that the whole sense of you have individual past lives, that's your ego. People are like, oh, they get all upset. It's like, well, my guru told me. Have you considered that maybe your guru is wrong? Maybe he doesn't actually know what he's talking about. Maybe your religious tradition is actually wrong, even though you've invested all this. So it makes people uncomfortable because there's kind of this radical nature to it. Um, but we are, I think, collectively moving forward that information about psychedelics is coming out of the underground, is coming out of the woods and coming out of the closet and all of that. And I think just like we're seeing with marijuana, cannabis, which is now happening across the United States and is happening around the world, that they're starting to legalize it because they say, wow, we were totally wrong about this plan. It's not evil. It's not bad. It's not going to turn you into a criminal. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to make you go insane. Um, so the truth is coming out about cannabis. And I think that the same thing is going to be happening about psychedelics. And I think that we're already in that process. So I overall am very hopeful that, you know, given enough time, that this will be something that's normal and natural. And that's why I've written a futuristic science, uh, science fiction novel wherein all of these things are just considered an ordinary part of everyday experience and there's no problem with it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think we're moving there, but I don't know when. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, you used to live in LA and now you live in a different part of the country, which means you've had different aspects of the quote uh, American experience. Sure. This is actually a two part question. Okay. Um, well, only if you would consider the Mescalera Apache Reservation um, sovereign territory and not technically part of the United States. But um, other than that, no. Okay. The reason I was asking this leads to my second question. So, as you were saying, you know, cannabis here and around the world, but uh, even before uh, the decriminalization and legalization started happening, things were happening over. Netherlands. So, two prime examples. One, you have the coffee shop. Two, uh, you probably just 
YouTube series called Drugs Lab. So you have these funny somethings. They actually take medicine on the air, and it's Dutch, but it's subtitled in English, and you get to see the physical effects when they describe the experience. Uh, apparently, you know, it, it's still illegal, of course, to procure the medicine, but the but because it's a in many ways a tolerant nation, I think that's why it's allowed to be produced there. So I guess the ultimate question is, do you see, based upon your knowledge of the cultures outside the U.S., uh, a, uh, a chance for uh, the, the, impo the impossibility for, to come out in the open with various medicines, uh, such as pollen or maybe some other parts of the world, or do you think it's more likely that the movement might start here in the good old U.S. of A.? Well, I, th I think really here the United States is actually playing catch up with some other countries. Um, really the United States is the initiator of the original drug war. And as you know, kind of the main international player, a lot of other countries followed along and followed suit with our policies. Um, and then a lot of countries learned that actually that wasn't to their benefit and that they especially seen how many people we put in prison every year and how that's not really beneficial to our society. A lot of other societies said, hey, we, we don't want to do that. Um, so we've seen now in uh, places in South America with recognizing legal, religious, and spiritual rights to use things like ayahuasca and things like that. Um, um, also in some Eastern Bloc countries in Europe where they actually never even had drug laws, like, like in the Czech Republic. Um, they just had their first conference at the Czech Republic. I think it was called Beyond Psychedelics. Um, I've had three of my books translated into Czech, which is really weird. It's like the only other language that my books have ever been translated into is Czech. But, and I've had people there tell me that. I said, well, it's because we were part of the Soviet Union, and we didn't have a drug war here. And then at the end of the Soviet Union, everybody got curious about psychedelics. And also, we didn't have any religion here because of the communist state, and so it's kind of a free-for-all now in the Czech Republic and other Eastern Bloc states. Um, so that they're, they're not dealing with our religious baggage, and they're also not dealing with our drug war baggage. And so they're just kind of saying, hey, we like psychedelics, let's have conferences and have books. And so it's more open and accepting there. So I think that here the United States is actually going to be following catch up a little bit with some other countries. But until the United States really makes really clear progress on this. I think that other places are just going to be bit by bit. When the United States goes and just says, OK, we're going to recognize this as religious rights, spiritual rights, human rights, that that's going to have a ripple effect around the country. And, and up until then, it's going to kind of be like cannabis legalization, where it's Oregon, Washington, then maybe California, then maybe Arizona, maybe. And so it kind of has this local ripple effect. But eventually, the federal government is going to have to be honest. The DEA is going to have to come out and say, it's not valid having this as a Schedule One drug because it doesn't fit any of the criteria. That We've certainly reached that point culturally. We haven't hit that point politically yet. Um, but the cultural and scientific knowledge is already there. Everybody knows there's no reason cannabis should be Schedule One. That that's not a, there's no legitimate argument. But politically, politicians haven't been able to say that fully, and the DEA hasn't been able to say that fully because it's their job to keep things illegal. So I think that. Once the United States really makes these changes um, at the top-down level, then we will see major changes. But until then, it's just going to be small things like the Santo Daime Church in Ashland, Oregon, suing the federal government and winning their right to drink daime, or the UDV suing to get their ayahuasca back, their wasca back from the federal government. There's going to be small little things like that. Um, I'm not sure what the tipping point is going to be. Um, Brad, we're probably out of time. Or, oh yeah, we stay a little longer. Yeah. Are you familiar with the ayahuasca made from fire and energy? Not personally, which disappoints me. Um, but uh, theoretically, yes. Um, that uh, there's been a couple times now where uh, there's there's lots of ayahuasca that takes place in southern Oregon where I live. Um, lots of ayahuasca arrows coming up and lots of people serving and drinking. And there's been a couple times where people told me after the fact, oh, we had this, we had this most amazing ayahuasca last night. It was unlike any ayahuasca we've ever had. And it was just so deep and so profound. And then they said it had 5-MeO in it. And it's like, oh, I wish I knew that before. 
So I haven't had a chance to drink it myself, but. Um, no, no, no. no instead of NN, it's the yeah, that the is is it's just the the mixture. It's how it's initially brewed. That the vast majority of ayahuasca brews are made with NN DMT, but there are some ayahuasca brews that are made with 5-MeO. And just from reports that I've heard from people who have had it, that they say it is just so much more powerful than any NN-based ayahuasca that they've ever had. Um, that that they really have been profoundly moved by it. But I haven't had a chance to try it myself. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the, the actual toad venom and the synthetic? Yeah. Um, well, toad venom comes from a toad, and synthetic doesn't. Um, uh, the toad venom contains a variety of different alkaloids within it. Uh, the prim primary one would be bufotenine, um, with only like 50, it varies between, I think, like maybe 10 to 20 percent is 5-MeO DMT within the, the toad venom itself. Um, so when you're using it, you need to use quite a, you need to use a, a large amount of material in order to get enough 5-MeO um, to have the full 5-MeO experience. Um, I do think that perhaps due to the mixture of alkaloids that are in um, the toad venom, that uh, on average the experience might last a little bit longer. I mean, we're not talking a whole lot longer, but maybe a little bit longer. Um, and it might have a slightly more visual component to it than the, the pure uh, synthetic 5-MeO, um, or even an extracted 5-MeO that's extracted from an organic source. Um, it's a little bit trickier to work with in that sense that you don't really know how much you're getting since you, you're not certain what the proportion is. I mean, that's, it's one of the things I see is the main advantage to working with just the pure molecules that you're able to know, well, I'm getting this much, and so you have a precise number. Um, and this is just a purely personal preference that toad venom itself kind of smells like stinky fish. Um, and then, especially if you're using it inside and then you're exhaling that, that you kind of get this stinky fish scent in the room. Um, so for someone like me that was using a room in his house and doing this three to five times a week with people that I didn't want to have that smell. I'd had some toad venom. It's like, mm, I just don't want that smell lingering around the house. Whereas if you're using pure 5-MeO-DMT, um, the scent is very light and it has kind of a floral scent to it um, and it dissipates really quickly. So it, it's basically, it's not as stinky. Um, and uh, what I have seen with people using toad venom is that sometimes people get into this thing where you have to really exhale out and then take a great big hit and really hold it in. Whereas if you're using, like say, pure free base 5-MeO DMT, you don't need to kind of go through acrobatics like that. You just exhale and then take a little hit and whoa, and it happens. But in terms of overall effect, um, you know, like I said, there might be slight differences in length and duration and slight differences in, in visual quality. I don't think that the overall quality of the experience between pure molecule and toad venom are really anything significant. You know, that you give somebody synthetic 5-MeO and they say, oh my god, I just experienced God, that was the most amazing experience of my life. You give someone toad medicine, like, oh my god, I just experienced God, the most amazing experience of my life, that they seem to be comparable based on reports. And just from my own experience of having had a freebase, salt form, purely lab produced um, organic extract from plant material and toad venom, that my own experience is that they're all pretty much the same. I don't, there's nothing that makes me say one is better than another. Something that's kind of hot right now as a topic of because there are a few individuals who are traveling around the world and giving toad venom to a variety of people, and so it's very public right now. One of my concerns there is that there is kind of, I'll just say it, there's a bit of a toad snobbery that's going on right now where people are like, oh, only OTAC, only toad. <laughs> you know, that I was recently in Ireland where some of these, pre uh, some of these providers had gone, and there's, there's like, it's like groupies and converts where people are like, oh, only toad is the spirit of the toad. And I'm trying to say, look, it's, it's not the spirit of the toad. It's like, this is, this is God, and God is in everything. And, and one of my things about recognizing that the ubiquity of God is that if you are playing favorites, 
you're not playing God because God doesn't play favorites. That, that I've seen people that are like, oh, well, there's, there's a, a quality of toad venom that is so much more sacred than something that comes from a lab. And like the term sacred at this point just rubs me the wrong way it's because everything's God. Nothing is more sacred than anything else. It's all the same. So it's fine to have preferences, but when people create identities around preferences, and that's something that I'm seeing with toad venom right now, is that people are creating identities around it that I don't enjoy. That that, I just, people get into these biases and that they think they're superior. I mean, there's this woman who, when I was in Ireland two years ago, she was one of these where she was just like, oh, only OTAC, only Toad. And she had a really uncomfortable time at my talk in Ireland. And then she came back again this year to my talk. And she came up after and said, I've gotten over being a Toad snob. And she was all proud of herself. And even then, it's like, oh, God, lady, just relax. Just relax. Um, and I will say, as someone who has worked with a lot of people who have worked with Toad Venom, that you know, they don't ever come back and tell me, like, oh, that was worse. That wasn't as good. Because you know, I've mostly had access to lab-produced molecule. Um, so I, I, just, I just see a lot of biases that are going on there. But you know, if someone prefers fishy smelling stuff, I mean, some people like that. <laughs> Honestly, some people are like, mm, I like that. And you know, that's fine. Just like some people are like, mm, I love ayahuasca. Whereas, I mean, I love the effects of ayahuasca. I don't love the taste. I mean, I'm, I'm really clear about that. Um, <laughs> It's like, I love mescaline. Man, I don't want to eat peyote. Oh, man, just give me some extracted mescaline, please. I don't want to eat peyote because it's, I don't like the taste. So it's OK to have personal preferences. It's when people add on a bunch of stuff to that, that's when I think it becomes problematic. Ashley. Um, when you talked about people um, orphaning to get out of their bilateral chemistry, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. Um, it really, 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 really depends. Um, sometimes, you know, I've had people where you give them medicine, and then immediately they're just up and they're all oh, they're dancing around, they're doing their thing or whatever, and it does, and it, it doesn't end. You know, they just keep doing it, and uh, you know, you want them to please come back and focus, and then. And then other times, it's just been clear, like, oh, wow, this person has been so wound up that they just need to thrash around the room for a while. And, and I can tell, when we get to the next round, they'll be settled down. So sometimes, I kind of jump on people right away and you know, stay focused, you know, come back, and try and bring them in. And other times, um, it's just clear that, oh, just let this person work it out for a little bit. Um, the main thing is if someone's coming for multiple sessions and they don't change their behavior, that's where there's the issue. Because then it's clear, oh, you weren't just unwinding, you were indulging. But when someone goes through that and then it's done and then they come down, then you can keep working. So it's, you know, it's, there's no hard and fast rules there. And it's especially when it's more minor deviations, that's when I'm really more on top of someone. So like if someone's lying there and their head moves over, then I might come and readjust their head. Or they're lying there and then one arm moves and then I'll come and readjust that arm for them. Or someone starts moving and maybe they're in the symmetry, but then they kind of break it and then I'll remind them, come back to symmetry and then they come back into that. And because what happens is, I mean, it's natural for people to squirm and move and want to do things um, to express themselves. But there's, there's this energy that occurs when you really lock in to the non-dual. And then it's just this pure, pure movement that's taking place. And it's, it's absolutely effortless. And when people do that, um, most of the time, they're not even aware that they're doing it, that people are moving and doing these things. And then you can see suddenly they're like looking at their hands like, whoa, what am I doing? What am I doing? But my job, at least as I see it, is to help people.
become aware of that and be centered in that, but still also not in control of it. And people get more out of it. So I mean, sometimes people think, oh, but, but what's wrong with dancing around and just having a good time? And it's like, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to get to the heart of it, and see, I insist, like, look, if you're coming to see me, if you're not coming to get to the heart of it, then go see someone else, because you're wasting my time and your time, because that's not what I do. I'm not here to help you indulge yourself. That when they do that, they get more out of it. So I've seen the benefit of that, and so sometimes I have to be kind of a hard ass with people. But sometimes there is, it's just useful for people to unwind themselves. So it's, it's always a case-by-case -case issue. It's, well, it's always up to the client, for one. Some people are ready for more after five minutes, and some people, they won't take more until 40 minutes later. So it really varies. The ideal, the ideal situation is, OK, if these are the structures of the ego, the, the ego opens up, then there's energetic processing that occurs. Is ideally, as soon as the ego starts to come back in, where the ego starts like, whoa, I'm tripping really, really hard. What have I been doing? Oh my god, whoa. That's the point where it's generally best take more right now. <laughs> and because this is also the time period where people are most likely to be really nauseous. That maybe they were just open and free, and then the ego comes back and they're like, oh, I need to throw up, I need to throw up. And I usually tell people, oh, well, good, have another hit. And then, boom, they open back up again, and then it comes out effortlessly. But again, it really, really varies in terms of time. This, on average, in working with people, we would do three rounds of medicine over an hour and a half to two hour time period. That that was kind of the standard. Um, but some people would go longer than that, and other people would be done within an hour. Um, so it, it really, really, really depends. I always say, look, from my perspective, it's the same thing. It's always people grappling with their ego. How that looks is unique for each and every person, because every person has constructed his or her ego through unique choices and unique unique life situation, so what that person's going to have to go through is not going to be what anybody else has to go through. So it's just about doing this kind of work is always just about having no agenda, no plan, and just being present with whatever arises as it arises and encountering that honestly. And if you can do that, I mean, that's, that's the modus operandi for all events in your life. <laughs> no plan, no agenda, just be present for what arises and be authentic with it as it arises and then see what happens from there. And so that's how I see working with people. Yeah. Uh, when you say no agenda or no plan, and you, earlier you said you don't really like people setting intentions, are there any maybe somatic practices that you can get people doing with their body beforehand, or body work, or anything like that that you seem to be helpful before you go into these truly soon experiences? Yeah, in general, um, something that can really help, it, you know, it seems really simple, but like dancing. Like freeform dancing, um, you know, a lot of people are just kind of disconnected from their bodies. They're disconnected from their feelings um, and how they feel as they move and express themselves. So learning how to move and express yourself, that is something that's very useful. For people who have busy minds, learning how to do quiet meditation can help as well, just to help settle the mind. So you know, I, sometimes I recommend like Zen meditation. Um, even you know, getting a massage or body work, especially again for people who are kind of disconnected from their bodies and kind of disassociate in those ways that getting people into their physicality, or it could even just be good sex for someone, like, yeah, go have some good sex and then do it, and then you know, you'll be more in yourself. Um, and also, just learning how to work with your body symmetrically can be very useful for people. So if I could just move this, I'll put the microphone back on. But like learning how and you know practicing this of learning how to work with your body symmetrically how to kind of roll over in the energy like this and go through these kinds of postures and positions because this is what happens spontaneously when people take five and the other it usually doesn't look quite as graceful as this because I've had a lot of practice with this but learning how to do that and see what happens is when people, so doing it that way, because that's mostly what it looks like, but you can do it standing up and kind of learning how to roll the energy up and out and kind of this continuous fluid movements 
what happens is people's breath get caught and then they, just, oh, they start gagging. And so it can actually have the same effect as taking medicine, of just learning how to be in your body. And it's kind of like, the way I would describe it is imagine that you're in water and you're moving through the water with the least possible resistance. So you're not pushing water, you're not pushing or pulling it, you're trying to cut through the water. And then, see when you take medicine, then it's like there's these tracks of energy, it's like, yeah, it's right there. Okay, I see it, there it is, right there. And I've even had people tell me in the middle of a session, like I tell them about the symmetry thing and how when people are really balanced in their energy that they never cross the center line, their hands might come over, but they just won't go over. And I've had, I can't tell you how many people I've had tell me, there's a line right here! There's a line! And I tell them, yeah, yeah, of course. There's a line right here because these are the two sides of your energy. So learning how to do this um, can help you so that when then you feel it. Also, paying attention to your body language. Um, if you have something difficult to say to someone, can you say it to them like this? You know, or people, uh, you know, people contort. And so, like learning how to pay attention to your body. How, because your energy is always communicated through your body language. Always. You cannot hide it. Even the best poker players, man, they can't hide it. Some people are really practiced at having a good poker face, like, oh, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm thinking, but then you can see like little micro movements, like, oh, I see you twiddling your fingers, you've got something going on there. So you observe your body language, especially when things make you uncomfortable or feel self-conscious. Observe your breath, observe, do you make little, little noises when you're uncomfortable, like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, can, you, can you look people in the eye? Or do you have, oh, Oh shit, oh I gotta look away. Oh, that's, a, that's too intense for me. <laughs> um, and observing these things and then trying something different. It's like, well, can I be honest with someone and talk to them as I'm squared away, that I'm facing them fully? Or do I have to, mm, you know, I don't really like it when you do that, you know? Or can you say, I do not like that? <laughs> you, know, you can be upfront and honest and try exploring these things that you feel these differences within your body. And a general rule that I always tell people is just practice being honest. And man, it's so much harder than you think. You think, oh yeah, I'll just be honest. And then you'll find throughout the day these little things like, oh, I didn't really say what I thought. I didn't really tell that person. I didn't really express myself. I, you know, I didn't really want to do that, but I wanted to make that person happy, so I did it anyway. And then, so learn. Learn how to pay attention to what's going on inside you. And yeah, use your body. Um, and do things that allow you to express yourself, like art, music. And that's why dancing is good, because you can just oh, let it out. And don't be afraid to cry. I mean, so many people, they're, they're holding so much on in their hearts, and there's so much in there, and they, they don't want to cry, and they don't want to feel it, because it feels like they're out of control, and they're, oh, I'm going to be sobbing forever. But all energy is just a wave, and your job is to let it crash and spill out. And then, oh. It's gone. Okay, I thought I was going to have to cry forever, but I was wrong. How about that? Okay, so you pay attention and you let the process happen. And, and if you work with medicine, any psychedelic medicine, I generally will divide all of my psychedelic experiences into two halves. Part one is the whatever half. And that is there's something that's going to release or there's something that's going to happen, and so I'm just going to be with it. And a lot of times when I take any psychedelics on my own, I just sit around and I kind of do my thing, and usually on the floor like I was showing before. I'm just doing my thing and doing my thing, and then eventually, <laughs> all right, take a little more and see if there's more, okay? Take a little more and then kind of go back to my, <laughs> and then I always know, like, okay, that's done. Oh, I've got 12 more hours to trip. What am I gonna do now? Okay, let's put on some documentaries, <laughs> okay? But the point is, is that first you do the work. You do the work. And then there, a process occurs. And as it's occurring, it's like, why is this happening? Oh my God, what is, oh, what's going on? And it's confusing and whatever. But then the energy releases. And then you're free in the sense of, well, then now you do whatever you want. But up until then, you maintain your symmetry. You practice that. And this is, again, it's any medicine. It's even cannabis. 
especially if you take cannabis and you feel like a little edgy, like, oh, I'm a little paranoid or oh, I'm clammy and sweaty. Man, go into symmetry. See what happens. Relax into your breath. Just focus on nothing. Nothing. Just observe what arises. Observe your discomfort. Observe the tendency to, oh, I think I should do something right now, or I gotta change the music, or turn the lights out, or turn the lights on, or change the temperature. Just feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it until it breaks. And then, phew, then, oh, okay, well, I'll do something else now, okay? So it's about being honest with yourself at that level, too. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, generally, when I'm working with people, uh, it's almost always just a full dose each time. Um, and I'm always putting enough on there for both of us. Um, and so it's not really varying in terms of amounts. And what I've found is that you get wildly different reactions from the same dosage at different times, depending on how that's reflecting that person's energy. So that um, you might give someone a whole lot and um, they're holding on, and so it's not breaking them through. And then at some point, they might even just have a really small hit, and then boom, it's really, really open. So it's not, it's only partially dose dependent, but I generally I just keep a consistent level going throughout the session. Um, and I'm not actually so interested in the length or duration that for me, what is more important um, is actually this opening and closing process that, which, that's why I don't like to work sessions with longer acting medicines because what's good is how it, the opening and closing, that the ego is kind of like metal where you think it's not gonna break, not gonna break, not gonna break, not gonna break, broke. So it's that repeated action of opening and closing that sometimes is really what's valuable. Whereas, so if you're snorting it and if you're going for 40 minutes or an hour, then you're not getting the opening and closing. So I, I find that that's actually really valuable in that kind of context. Now, if you wanted, say, a longer session just to kind of bask in it, then yeah, you'd want to take some of the salt and snort it, and then, then you have a longer time period. If you want to go even longer, then you'd work with something like 5-MeO-MIPT, which is that it's going to last hours and hours and hours and is very similar to 5-MeO-DMT. But like that's a, sometimes I have people ask me to use that in a session, and it's, oh, God, do we have to? Because that means they're going to have someone there for like five hours. They're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do now. I don't know what to do. It's just do whatever you want. Just relax. Do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, because we've already reached the point, you know. But it's, yes, the, it's the opening and closing that actually is the most effective. Joseph. I was curious. Um, I feel like the, the gem is in, in the puke in a way because you can almost back map people's like trauma and their physical illness and toxins and all that stuff and it's, it's coming out. And I feel like, have you had any observations about stillness or the, the overlap, the interplay of stuff? spiritual energy versus somatic relief um, and unpacking some of that. Sometimes it's just like black gunk that's coming out. And other times it's, it's, it's invaluable to look at for, for healing as a healing technology. Yeah. Well, in terms of all the things that come out, I like to make distinctions that, of course, we have things like expressive releases, like our laughing and crying, things like that. Then there's also energetic gagging where people are just and then finally that releases. Then there's what I call um, the faucet where people open their mouths and water, just saliva just pours out. I mean, you can put a glass there and I can fill the glass and fill another glass and fill another glass. Then there's kind of a frothy, bubbly mucus that tends to show up in men more than women where it kind of seems like the whole body is turning into a penis and they're ejaculating, they're kind of going it's just like foaming over. Then there's kind of bile, and then there's the full contest of the stomach. Um, and then there's also what I call the champagne cork, where this tends to happen if someone's really ready to go all the way and you give them a hit and then immediately just go, it just explodes out of them. 
And most often when that happens, people are releasing something that they were ashamed of or afraid of, and they find that, oh, it's part of me and I can love it. And so they take it and they rub it all over themselves and they like bask in it and they throw up and do it more. Or if, they, if there's a pool on the floor, that they go and they rub their faces in it and they're just loving it. And so I think sometimes the physicality of what's coming out is important, but I think other times it's just the fact that it's kind of releasing energetic knots as it's going through, and so the physicality of it doesn't matter so much. And especially when it's coming out of me, I mean, it's such a curious thing, you know, how I can take a hit and the client will feel it and then all throw up and they feel better. It's such a curious thing that, so then obviously it's not, it's not necessarily the physicality, it's just the fact that the energy has been released and it was done in their presence that helped them in some capacity. Um, so I think, it, I think it's a really complicated issue. And I mean, this is one of the things that I'd love to see, like, man, somebody's got to study this in a lab and like, what's going on here? How is this actually helping people? Because it does help people. And then sometimes it can be directly connected to people's physical issues. Like the one story that I really like to share with people is how I had this guy come from Colorado and he did three sessions with me. And on the last one, he kind of fell back and he's like, I'm letting go of everything I ever thought I was. And he was just, it was just like a volcano, just vomit. Just, I mean, he was lying down. I was at the foot and I, he like got me on the face. It's like, oh my God, this guy's really going for it. <laughs> and then he went home to Colorado and see, like I said, I don't ever ask people like, well, what are you looking for? Or what are you working on? Because it doesn't matter to me. It's like, look, we're going to find out. Okay, we're going to take some measure, we're going to find out what's going on, so you don't need to tell me anything. But anyway, he got home, and he sends me an email, and he said that he had had testicular cancer, and had had a testicle removed, and had been 100% impotent for six months. And he said he got home, walked in the door, saw his wife, immediately had an erection, stripping off his clothes, and they're making love. And so he's sending me an email, he's like, thank you so much. I was like, well, good for you, man, I'm glad you threw up. But that was <laughs> clearly that was connected somehow. And mm -hmm. you know, especially with women, I've also found in working different places of their body, where like I might be working on a woman's throat here, and then afterwards she tells me, like, man, that was all sexual for me. That was all about what was going on down here. And so there's just this interesting connectivity between the whole thing. And then even sometimes I find my thumbs are like way down people's throats. Again, it's not something I'm planning on, it's just I'm going at them and, all, and it's like a magnet. My thumbs are like, whoa, way down their throats. And then it's like their body is like sucking my thumbs in and it's like deeper, 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 and then all of a sudden, ah, and then, ah, oh, and then through that release. And so this is part of it that's like, I don't know what the hell's going on. I just know that it is going on and that it's a fundamental part of the process but I couldn't tell you if, well, do you need to throw it up or do you not need to throw it up or what? Is it just energetic or what? But I will say that in the work that I do with people, um, they're all, if someone does a number of sessions with me, even if I've purged for them every time, there always comes a point where my body will eventually say, nope, your turn. <laughs> and then the client will throw up. And then they'll throw up for a period of time, and maybe they come for a number of sessions, and they're throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. Then there comes a point where, where they don't throw up anymore. I've also found that if someone comes and does a session, we have a bunch of stuff released. If they come back sooner rather than later, then it's easier to move on to point B, and then there'll be less purging that needs to take place. But we had a great big release, and then someone comes back a year later, they've usually reestablished all that stuff, and we kind of have to go back to point A again. So I think, it, I think it's a, just a complex process, and I, I wish I understood it better other than just something that I've had to live through so many damn times. Is purging necessary for that cathartic breakthrough? Not always, but in general, in, in my practice of working with people, most people don't throw up most of the time, but most people will throw up at some point, and it becomes very, very important for them that they did so. So 
it's, it's not like it has to happen all the time or that it's always necessary, but in, in my experience, everyone that I've worked with, which you know might be a self-selecting audience, but everyone I've worked with has had stuff that needs to come out. And, and this includes people, again, who have had 5-MeO in another context, and they think it's just all sparkly lights and roses, that they, they don't even imagine that people throw up on this, and they come and work with me, and they're like, oh, the universe is turning inside out, ah, blah. <laughs> but then usually afterwards, people are just like, thank you so much, oh my god, I didn't even know that was there. And that, that also seems to be a common theme, is that people are releasing stuff that they had no awareness they were holding on to. Even, again, people who have spent years working with ayahuasca and stuff, you give them 5-MeO, and it's like, oh, shit, oh, I thought I was done, but no, there's all this stuff. So, no, it's not always necessary, and it's not necessary for most people most of the time, but if you're doing the work, sooner or later, it's going to show up, and it's going to be very important for that person when that does occur. Yes, ma'am. I think you talked about microdosing. Well, <laughs> you know, okay. I myself, okay, me personally, when I take something, I'm kind of a gung ho person about it. It's like I don't want to fuck around. It's like. If I'm going to spend my time on a medicine, I want it to be like, yeah, it's on. And you know, even when, I've tried like microdosing mushrooms, but I'm so impatient. You know, it's like I, it's like, no, we'll just, we'll just take a little more. We'll just, just take a little more, because I like reaching that level. But certainly, there are anecdotal reports from people that they feel that microdosing is beneficial to them, and so you know, that sounds fine. I don't think that there would be any reasonable relationship between microdosing and non-dual breakthroughs. That I don't think, that, that doesn't seem realistic to me at all. Because the ego is so profoundly resilient, it really needs a cosmic axe kicking to really break <laughs> open in most circumstances. Well, I'm thinking about like chipping away little by little versus the cosmic axe. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, the problem, though, is that the, the resiliency of the ego means that it's um, capable of reconfiguring in split-second micro-adjustments. And so this is why, again, people who maybe have spent years meditating or years with ayahuasca, that you give them one experience with 5-MeO, and they're like, I never even got anywhere close to that. It's because the ego reconfigures. So you get these nice little openings, but then it goes, <laughs> I reconfigured, and then it opens up a little bit, and OK, I found a new way to reconfigure. And you know, sometimes it's just got to be all out, just throw your ass to the floor and just pummel that thing. Because see, the ego both wants to be defeated and doesn't want to be defeated. And when it can reach, that's, that's why 5-MeO is so effective for non-dual states of awareness versus any other psychedelic where non-dual breakthroughs are still relatively rare, that 5-MeO presents the ego with an experience where it says, fuck it, I can't fight this, and it gives up. Whereas most things, it's like, oh, well, I can sort of deal with this, or I can sort of deal with it. I'm really uncomfortable, but I, I'll reconfigure. So, I'd, I'm skeptical that microdosing would help in that capacity. Now, maybe, you know, if people are suffering like cluster headaches or something like that, and if they find that microdosing helps keep those away, that, you know, it could have applications. But I don't think for non-dual energetic therapy, I don't think it would have much application. Maybe we'll do like two more. So you two are the last. So we'll start with you, then we'll go to you. Non-dual energetic therapy. Yeah. I, like Rich Sossman has worked with a lot of people, so Ted Henning, EMT, but nobody else. Do you have an apprentice? Are you training a... <laughs> um, that's, honestly, that was one of the things that when I started doing this, I was like, oh, man, I'll be able to teach other people how to do this, and this will be great, and it'll spread, and, and it'll like bring people to new levels of awareness. And you know, that was just hopeful on my part, that I've had people specifically come to try and apprentice themselves with me and learn about how I do what I do. But they all treat it as, 
I want to learn what Martin does so that I can do that. Whereas I learned what I do by doing it and by accepting myself. See, which is different because I was like, I just want to be me. And other people are like, I want to learn how to be Martin. Okay, so they haven't been able to do it. So at this point I have some people who have really dedicated themselves to that and, and they even do sessions with people, man, and then they come sit back in front of me and they're just squirmy. I can tell that, and they know it, they know it. So, and I, so I know this is a very, very grandiose statement. I don't think there's anybody else on this planet who works the way that I do, and I don't think there ever has been, that I don't see any evidence of that. I've never heard stories of it. And with people who have worked with me that have all different other kinds of contexts, they all tell me, like, I've never had an experience like this. Not, not at this level, okay? Even, keep in mind, most shamans will work, the client is here, and people do stuff to the body, whereas I'm gonna face you like this. This is totally different than having someone stand at your side and work on you energetically. To face someone, totally different ball game, okay? And I'm just right there in the center. I'm just right there waiting. And I can see you. I know when you're there and I know when you're not. And it's, it's intense. It's intense. And other people use ritual and songs and ceremony. I don't have any distractions. I'm just looking at you. That's it. So I haven't heard of anybody that can do it the way that I can do it. Um, and that's part of what's allowing me to retire a little bit. It's like, because I thought, well, oh, I'll train other people and this will be great. It's like, well, no, that, that's obviously not happening. So I can let that one go. So how much throwing up do I want to do for other people? I mean, I'm happy to help other people, but I stopped learning a long time ago in terms of this process. You know, I've seen all the ways that people react. There's nothing that surprises me anymore. Even the guy who punched me and tried to kill me. I've had other people attack me. So even that wasn't new. I didn't have anybody hit me quite so hard. I mean, man, I've never been hit that hard in my life. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's, I haven't felt like I've been learning anything or seen anything new. It's just like, okay, do variations on a theme, variations on a theme. And so I've really reached the point of, well, how much more do I want to give of myself to other people, not to be selfish, because I, I want to give, because I love, I mean, every other person is another version of me, and man, I love them. Man, I love them so big. I'll just keep giving and giving and giving, but maybe I want to do other things with my time. Play some more music or write a few more novels or something. Not throw, you know, keep some of my food would be nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm up for that. Um, but no, I don't think there's anybody else who practices the way that I do. And if there are, I don't know them. Yeah, ma'am. Okay, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I cannot tell you how, especially men too, but mainly women, man, they want to have sex right then and there in the middle of the session. I mean, it's very, very clear what's going on there, and which also is very natural because what else is God doing? I mean, God has a few options. Kill, which is lots of fun. Sex, even more fun, or eat them. Okay, so consume, interacting with the other. I mean, there's only a limited number of choices and everything else is kind of playing that out. So, especially many women get very, very sexual. Um, so, if I were the kind of person that's like, hey, I want to give people medicine and let's just mm -hmm. manipulate my way into their loins, I mean, that'd be really, really easy to do. That would not be a problem. Um, I have never had sex with a client. I have never engaged sexually. Sometimes I am touching people on their genitals because that's what they need. Um, but when, so it's got to be honest, it's got to be real. That's the, that's the one thing, it's the only thing I'm concerned about is, is it real? Is it genuine? And I have never felt that it needs to go 
to that level. Even with someone's crawling on top of me and clearly I could do whatever I want with this person because actually I just want to be with my wife, really. I mean, that's why I went through all the trouble of doing all these sessions with hers because I want to be with you and if you don't accept me for as I am, man, ain't nobody else going to do it because you're the one who's been here and seen me go through this whole damn crazy process. So energetically, that's just been very clear with me. Um, and I know it's been disappointing for some of the women who have come because they want that there in that moment. Um, but that's not what I'm there for. I'm, because really what they want is they want, they don't just want to have sex in that moment. They want a partner who's going to be there and reflect genuinely back to them so that they can just open their heart and just be free. And sorry, I'm not going to be that for you because I'm here with my wife and this is my child and this is my life. And so, so it's never gone to that. But there's the potential for people to abuse that. And yes, I have heard reports from other people of other providers that that is what they do. Okay, so that's out there. Um, and this is why to really, this is, see, this is why I haven't been able to train anyone. Because to train someone to do the way that I do it, they must know themselves at the level that I know myself, and they must trust themselves at the level that I trust myself. And I've never found anyone who has that. So they do get caught by their ego. They're like, I don't know what to do. See, I don't ever know what to do, so I don't worry about it. All I do is what needs doing. Because the energy is there. Put your hands on the person right there. Do it. Ah! Why are you doing that? I don't know. It's what needs to happen. That's the only thing that I do. So it's like sometimes after a session, people ask me, well, what, what did that mean? And what did that mean? And then you work here. What did that mean? And, what, and they want to know a story. And they're like, well, what did you see? And I always just tell them, I'm not looking, first of all. All I'm doing is feeling. And all, it's just energy. All it is is energy. And all I'm doing is using my body to express the energy in a way that's authentic. And that's the only thing. Other than that, there's no plan. There's no agenda. Well, did you work on this chakra and do that? I just, no, I know. I just moved the energy. That's all that I did. And I did it in a way that's authentic. But for people who have their ego and that I want to be this for this person, and I want to, you know, I'm doing these things to you or whatever, that there's so much potential for abuse. And, and not even with 5-MeO. I mean, you hear this about cases with people going down to South America and drinking ayahuasca, and all of a sudden they're being sexually abused by their shaman. That, sure, the field's ripe for it, because people are in vulnerable open states, and there's lots of people out there working with medicines through their ego. And because here's the thing, no medicine ever, ever, ever can violate your free will, because it is merely an amplification of yourself. So if you are not choosing to overcome your bullshit, it's not going to do it for you. It's not going to magically be like, boom, you're enlightened, ha, you're free. You have to work on it. I did it for myself because I was committed to one and one thing only, and that was the truth. All I wanted to know, who am I? Who am I? What is this? What's going on here? I want to know. I'm, I'm committed. I'm going to go through whatever it takes, and if it kills me, then kill me. Do it. I'm ready. So I came out the other end. And now I'm just myself, because I was committed to that. Not because I wanted to be anything. I didn't want to work with people. I didn't want to do this. I don't want to do I don't want to throw up for people. It's fucking no fun. <laughs> it's no fun. I don't want to do it. But I want to be true. And true for me also meant in learning, look, everything's God. So everything's me. And I love myself. That means I love everyone and everything. Oh my God. I love, I love. I mean, that, I can't tell you how many times I went through that. It's like, I just want to love. I'd take five of me. I'm like, I don't know who I am. I just want to love. I'd say that again and again and again. Because it's, it's true. I just love. I love all of you. I love everything, everything, everything. There's nothing that I hate. No toxic waste. No Donald Trump. Nothing. I love all of it. All of it. Because it's just, there's this infinite explosion of love. Always. 24 hours a day. And so I just wanted to learn how to ride with that and just do it in a way that is centered. And so it takes commitment. And not everybody's committed to that. And I don't blame them because it was fucking terrifying and it was really, really hard. And I really thought I was going crazy for a long, long time. And 
It wasn't easy. It's not hard letting go of everything you think you know. I mean, it's liberating, but it's not necessarily fun. You know, because from the ego's perspective, man, it would be so much easier if there really were somebody in charge and you can like ask them for favors and like, please God, don't make me go through this. And like, so there was someone there to like hold your hand and save you and take care of you. And it's like, fuck, it's, it's fucking me. Fuck. Fuck, I wish it were God, but it's fucking me. I don't know what I'm doing. Ah! Okay, <laughs> so it's not fun. But there's other aspects that are a lot of fun because, man, you're just energy. You're just energy, and it's, oh, there's so many delicious states of energy to just find that, oh, I'm just energy. Ah, I can be free. I'm free every moment. Every moment I'm free. Ah, I love life. Oh, my God. Yeah. Great, thank you.